Stage 12 of the Tour de France and it's the third of three big days through the Alps. The terrain is intimidating. Some of the sprinters have already been the victims of the mountains. The climbers have come to the fore and it's Geran Thomas who's in the yellow jersey. Walks on Maurice that hosts the start of stage 12 and is then to the famed Alpe d'Huez for the 31st time in the history of the race, the 30th time it's hosted the stage finish. The major climbs on the stage today, the first is the Col de Madeleine and this is a beast of a climb at 25 kilometres. It's then on to the category 2 climb with its famed hairpins, followed by the Col de la Quad Affair which is almost 30 kilometres in length and then it's up to the 21 hairpins of Alpe d'Huez. Borg Saint Maurice is bathed in sunshine. So too is the finish line. What has the race got in store for us today? I'm expecting an early breakaway, and it's Team Sky who will be on the front controlling things. Who can challenge? Well, Matt, Team Sky have been controlling on the front even before they had the yellow jersey. In fact, they've never had to wait this long in the Tour de France to have the yellow jersey. Whether they've been in it or not, they've been riding as if they're leading. And I expect today the first major attack from Chris Froome. Forget the fact that Geraint Thomas is leading the tour. The plan is Chris Froome. He is the team leader and he needs to distance other rivals even more. I wonder if you'll distance Geraint Thomas enough to take yellow and just how they'll play it. But I'm sure it's going to be for Froome. This is going to be his day. Geraint Thomas himself has spoken about the fact that Chris Froome is still the leader. And Alp Dewez has been the site of perhaps the most famous in-house battle within a team. And that goes back to 1986 when Bernard Hinault, the great Frenchman who prior to that tour had won it five times, was on target potentially to win it for a sixth. And his teammate Greg LeMond was aiming to win it for the first time. They went across the finish line hand in hand. I wonder if we'll see such sights like that today. Old fortified chateau at the top of the mountain overlooking Borg Saint Maurice. Previously a fortified chateau to try and keep at bay any of the invading forces. But Borg Saint Maurice, it has been the host of a number of stages of the Tour de France in the past. Well, here's Peter Sagan, one of the sprinters who made it fairly comfortably yesterday. Some of the others not so comfortable. They really had to push hard to make it on time. And as I said, Cavendish and Kittel are out of the race outside the time limit. We just saw a picture there of Alejandro Valverde on the attack yesterday. Very aggressive race by Movistar. And I said, I think it'll be Chris Froome's day to attack. I don't discount other GC favourites. They're still not out of it. And Tom Dumoulin, he put on a great performance yesterday, attacking in the descent before the final climb, getting out to a minute, and he was the man who had the most pressure on Team Sky. Hopefully Tom Dumoulin can really keep improving as the race goes on, reach his best form, but today will be telling. Gil, a chance at the stage victory. He wasn't able to cap it off for them, but really encouraging signs for the Frenchman, who was a dual stage winner last year and winner of the Mountains jersey. Number 72 then, Andre Amador from Movistar, moving to the left-hand side of the road, peering over the edge to see whether he can spot the peloton led by Sky. 1.8 kilometres to the top of the climb. Number 26, Pierre Latour. Having a chat here to Julien Alaphilippe, part of the new generation of French cyclists. Does Pierre Latour get a chance to race for White as a teammate of Roman Bardet? Bardet, third last year, second the year before. Of course, time will tell. Yesterday, Bardet was ridden out to 59 seconds by Geraint Thomas. If he continues to lose time like that, the team will find that white jersey more and more important. And Pierre Latour, at the moment, there's no reason for him to sacrifice himself for Roman Bardet. Bardet has to stick with Team Sky as long as he can. That will set up his GC. Then, if he's good enough, he can try to go on the attack and take some time back. Until then, Pierre Latour, if I was team manager, I would say keep doing what you're doing. And what he is doing is a great job. And we saw him yesterday. He was looking rough and ready all over the bike on his way up the second last climb. So I can guarantee you one thing, 
He'll still be doing that on the final metres to the finish line, regardless of where Bardet is. He did exactly that and defended white. UAE now coming to the front with the very big figure of Rory Sutherland. Vincenzo Nibali, no hands, looking very comfortable, but Rory Sutherland for Dan Martin. Dan is one of the guys who wants to really get aggressive on Alp Duez. He first rode it as a 12-year-old. He's got fond memories of going up the climb with his father, Neil, a former British national champion. And Dan Martin will draw great confidence from yesterday's ride, where it looked like he was being dropped when all the attacks started in the group of favourites. Bided his time, just rode his way back on and then hit over the top of them. Had Chris Froome sitting in his wheel, who then eventually did a few turns with Dan Martin, dropped him in the end. But Dan Martin did a great ride yesterday and distanced all the others like Quintana and Bardet. Dan Martin crossing line 27 seconds behind Geraint Thomas. Only seven seconds behind Chris Froome and Tom Dumoulin. I'm not so surprised by Rory Sutherland being in that group. It's a fantastic ride, but less surprising if you consider Luke Rowe is still there. Similar type of rider, those bigger bodies that their teams use to look after their team leaders on the flat, but also can hold their own on a decent sized climb when there's still 50 or 60 riders left in the peloton. In this breakaway group, the white jersey, Pierre Latour, does he defend the white jersey or does he ride for Roman Bardet? We caught up with him before the start of today's stage. So here he is, the young Frenchman from AG Toile Le Mondial, the leader of the best. Bardet, still the priority. But Pierre Latour, he just has to sit in this group and wait. Now Warren Barguil, this is still a long way to the top of the climb. Alaphilippe is right behind him and then it's Raphael Micah. Michael's won the King of the Mountains classification twice in the past. Barguil won it last year. Alaphilippe wants it this year. Well, Raphael Micah, a two-time being worn by the man in second wheel. Alaphilippe, Warren Barguil, the winner last year. Serge Poles, 12 points off the lead of the competition. But Alaphilippe in control of this group. He's been sitting a long way back in the group, just letting himself float along with the pace being set. Now in the final kilometre, up to that King of the Mountains line. Now gets himself back to the front. Molberger comes to the front for Bora Hansgrohe. This is a real sprint for 20 points. Pierre Roland wants a piece of it as well. This is Maxim Bouet in the white colours, trying to lead Warren Barguil out. Warren Barguil, he slips himself alongside Pierre Roland, but the most explosive from this group, without question, is Juliana Alaphilippe. On the hunt for 20 more points. Pierre Roland is trying to go across to him. Barguil gets into his slipstream. Alaphilippe, he's gone early. Warren Barguil is slowly rolling towards him, but it's a little too late. 20 more points in the race for the Polka Dots for Julian Alaphilippe. Uh, Alaphilippe leads across. Barguil in second. And then in the background, Serge Poles with a throw to the line, trying to get his wheel across there in front of Pierre Roland. So not giving up hope in that competition. Raphael Maker a lot further back. The man from Bora Hansgrohe back in the peloton. And the team cars are passing to go up to the break now. Peter Sagan, he's hung on to the group with that pace being set by Luke Rowe. Much easier for Sagan to manage because that gap has gone out by 45 seconds and since Rowe got back to the front. In the race for the King of the Mountains jersey, Julian Alaphilippe now leads by 25 points ahead of Warren Barguil. Musette bags, the feed bags, that one being collected by Walt Poles. And now on to the descent. The breakaway will take more risks than the peloton and in theory should be able to extend that lead. At the top, 2.30 is the gap. Looking forward to seeing what it is at the bottom. Well, an altitude drop of just over 1,500 metres in 21 kilometres. Average gradient around seven and a half, eight percent on this descent, so steeper than the climb itself, and no flat sections. So none of those sections where it flattens off and then kicks up again. It is all straight downhill. It's a very fast descent. You see how open it is at these altitudes too. They've just gone over 2,000 metres above sea level. 
that's the point where you really start to feel the lack of oxygen. Most athletes have ever raced at altitude will tell you, you start to get to that point, you feel it kicking in, you start to gasp a little bit more, you start to gulp it in, and you, you really do feel that thinner air. You can feel it even without exercising. We stayed overnight on Alpe d'Huez, which is at 1,850 metres, and just walking up a flight of stairs or walking across the village, you think, geez, I'm a little unfit. I'm slightly out of breath and I shouldn't be. It catches you by surprise, and these guys are riding their bikes on 170 plus kilometres on stage 12 of the tour, with lots of Ks already in their legs. So what you're saying, with our little one kilometre walk across to our commentary position, we're a little bit out of breath coming up the, the hill towards the finish line. We're claiming altitude, not our lack of physical condition. That's my excuse. I'll stick with it too. Altitude training. We're in it together. 2.43 now, the gap at the top. It was 2.30 when the breakaway started the descent. We're pushing out towards the three minute mark and I wouldn't be too surprised if it's four minutes or more by the time we get to the bottom. And we know how Julian Alaphilippe hates touching his brakes on the way downhill. 2.45, that means we have a new virtual race leader. Stephen Kruisweig in the breakaway, start of the day at 2.40 behind Garant Thomas. He's now in the lead on the road, but Sky, they've got the fortress built around their leaders. Froome and Thomas are so well protected. More than an hour, 25 kilometres long. The first 23 kilometres took them 23 minutes. Super fast start with lots of riders trying to get into the breakaway, but the Col de Madeleine is an enormous climb. But there's a bigger one to come, the Cobbler Quad Affair. We can put it like that, the, that first 25 kilometres in 25 minutes, the 25 kilometres of the Madeleine took them about an hour and three. Even more. 19 per hour, in fact, it took them an hour and a quarter. Now at the front, we see the Bora Hans Grower team. This is Molberger, Gregor Molberger, and the King of the Mountains jersey, one of your favourites. Julian Alaphilippe followed by Warren Barguil. Well, he's so good to watch, Alaphilippe. Just a really exciting rider, always prepared to attack, always prepared to take a risk in the race. And Barguil, he is trying to follow Alaphilippe. This is a handy lead to build up. Though once they do get to the bottom, that's a kilometre 73 and a half. They've got a bit of a valley, which is around seven and a half to eight kilometers long before they hit the La Sette de Montvernier. That's the category two climb. And at the bottom of the climb, they'll go through the feed zone. We'll see if these riders open up a break on the breakaway and decide to push on with it. Or it might be a real reshuffle. Possibility of getting rid of Steven Kreuzweig, who's not renowned for his descending skills. Do you think that crash that he had in the Giro in 2016 would still not necessarily haunt him, that might be too strong a word, but just sit at the back of his mind and a little hint of self-doubt. I still think it would, yes. This is Simon Clark at the back of the group. This is the main peloton. Clark still in contact. He was under a little bit of pressure with a few kilometres to go on the climb, but Clark has held on. Simon Clark also a very good descender, just rolling his way back through that main peloton, led by Team Sky. Easy does it, nice and safe. Warren Barguil down in the aero tuck, sitting on the top tube and just trying to get back into the slipstream of Julian Alaphilippe and Gregor Mulberger. 75 kilometres an hour, roughly. And Barguil still about five seconds off the back of these two. And I think in this corner, just losing another second or so. Alaphilippe makes it look so easy. Barguil now having to spend a lot of energy to chase to get back on. So to all the others. This is the peloton still being led by Sky, not taking too many risks, but they're not exactly going down here slowly. They're conceding a little bit of ground on the breakaway. Well, 15 seconds already after just four or five kilometres of descending. Some of the spectacular scenery here in the Alps. There's unique formations on the flanks of the Cordelier Madeleine. And this is Le Cheminier du Fee. 
the earth pillars. They are stunning. And the pillars of the fairies. Fi is French for fairy. Now it's at three minutes and four seconds now, the advantage for the breakaway. The yellow jersey sitting on the shoulders of Geraint Thomas. But is he the team leader for Sky? He says no, he says it's Froome. And you have to expect that it is Chris Froome. The gap between them is only a minute and 25 seconds. Well, I go back to that tweet from Team Sky. There is no team leadership issue at Team Sky. Then the next one. The issue of team leadership will work itself out on the road. Maybe they've got two different people um, with access to their social media account. <laughs> one's a Froome supporter, one's a Thomas supporter. Who knows? Well, Garant Thomas is very much part of the system, the British cycling system, coming up through the track program. What a journey it's been for Garant Thomas. When he made his debut in the tour back in 2007, the same time Mark Cavendish made his debut with a whole lot of fanfare around him, Garant Thomas was the youngest rider in the race at 21 years of age, and he finished. He finished second last. We're now into the mountains, and he's at the top end of the table in the general classification. He's gone from being a world-class Olympic champion track cyclist, particularly in the team's pursuit, and now he is the man to beat at the Tour. He's the rider. They have to get that yellow jersey off. So this road, construction began in 1928, took them six years to finish it. Finished in 1934. 17 hairpins on the way up. A lot of publications say 18. One's questionable. There's no spectators on it. No cars allowed to come up here. It's been closed at the bottom. Because of their hairpins and how narrow it is, this is the race organisation keeping the riders safe. There'll be lots of people, though, that'll be really close to them when they get to the final climb of Alp Duez. Well, this climb, 17 linked hairpins, then one off on its own. Final climb does even better than that. Alp Duez with its famous 21 hairpins, each hairpin named after a former winner of the Tour de France stage atop Alp Duez. It is the most famous climb in cycling, Alp Duez. It was first scaled way back in 1952, the first mountaintop finish of the Tour de France. The great Italian Fausto Coppi was the winner, but they waited a long time before they went up there again. The next time, it was 1976, and that's when the Dutch love affair started with Alp Duez. Joop Zudemelk won. The following year, it was another Dutchman, Henny Kuiper. Henny Kuiper won again the next year. Zudemelk won a few years later on. Peter winning. Lots of Dutch success early in the history of Alp Duez. The most recent Dutchman to win was back in 1989, when it was Gert Jan Tunisse who won. And that was the year after another Dutchman, Stefan Rox, was the winner. Well, this is on the top of the La Sette de Montvenier, La Chapelle de Immaculée Conception. And it took four years to build. Between, Sorry, the foot, not the top. It took four years to build between 1855 and 1859 on the side of what used to be a fort that was defending the bridge since 1999. Once night falls, there's a light that shines out that acts like a lighthouse and goes across the valley. There's a similar chapel at the top, but that's the Chapelle Notre Dame de la Balme. So also hexagonally shaped, and there's a great aerial shot. Very hard to get a good photograph of this climb. Once you've ridden up it and you want to show everyone what you've done, but there's a secret to it. You get to the top, just after the chapel, there's a field on the right, there's a track that runs through it. Go that along that, through the trees, there's a lookout atop the cliff, and you can get a photo of it. For all those who aspire to ride it and then document that, because let's face it, if it's not on Instagram or Strava, no one's gonna believe it happened. That's how you get the shot. Hashtag anything for the shot. At the back of the peloton, that was number 181. That is Lillian Kalmajan. Stage winner in the race last year in his first appearance in the tour. He's been in a few breakaways this year, but his legs don't look quite as strong as what they were 12 months ago. Still Johnny Moscon and Luke Rowe, the two riders at the front. You got this. That's the sign on the road as Garant Thomas says to Johnny Moscon, you're my man, just keep on going. Pierre Roland, a picture of concentration. 
it was a French hope for a while to challenge for the overall classification of the Tour. Twice a top 10 finisher. He's won two stages in the mountains in the Tour before. He's been top five at the Tour of Italy, a stage winner there also. Today, it's all about the stage victory for him and for the team, Education First Rapac. Such a blow to lose their team leader, Rigoberto Uran. Rigoberto Uran, second overall last year. He was unable to start today. Sky still in complete control. This is Luke Rowe now who comes to the front as Gianni Moscon settles into the rhythm in second position. Eighteen seconds in front for Pierre Rolon. That's in front of his former breakaway companions. There's still, still 25 riders in that chasing group. The best of them in the overall classification, Stephen Kruzvay, who is now the virtual race leader on the road. Alejandro Valverde is in the group. He wears the red number, having been the most combative on yesterday's stage. Ilnar Zakarin is there, who was third last year in the Tour of Spain, which was won by Fru ahead of Nibali. Also in there is Miguel Nieve, known as Frosty Nieve, being the Spanish word for snow. So unlucky yesterday when he was caught with just 400 metres to go on the stage. TJ Van Garderen is also still in that breakaway group. Warren Barguil, Pierre Latour, Serge Pals, amongst the other men, chasing this rider on his own, Pierre Roland. Peloton is still a really big group. Breakaway and Peloton on the same climb. And only about 10 hairpins between them. Luke Rowe leading Team Sky, and look how narrow that is. If you want to know why vehicles are not allowed, and certainly at any time of the year, heavy vehicles are not allowed on this climb, they get wedged. Great climb to have a stage finish at the top of. There's not much room for the infrastructure, but any race to finish at the top of this one. Can you imagine how explosive and aggressive it would be, accelerating out of the hairpins? Be fabulous to watch. Speaking of that, all those straights are not exactly equal in length, but on average, there's a hairpin every 150 metres of this climb. It's an uphill criterion. So it tests your climbing skills and your cornering skills. Appropriately, the polka dot jersey for the King of the Mountains classification. And there's some climbing on the side of the cliff. That's some ladder. That made my feet tingle. Not for me. Twenty-five seconds. Pierre Roland is extending his advantage. It's 350 to the Peloton, but still with so far to go, surely Pierre Roland would like some company. This is a very, very long range break. Across the top, bit of a plateau across the top of La Sette de Montvernier. Short descent. Then a very short valley section, just a kilometre or two. Then he will start on the climb of the Col de la Croix de Fer, the Iron Cross. 29 kilometres, 5.2% at the moment. He's one kilometre away from the top of this Category 2 climb. I think it's a bit too far to go solo. And I maintain he's still too worried about the whereabouts of Stephen Kreuzweg, his presence in that group. But other riders back in the group, and I'm thinking particularly, and after yesterday and the performance so far today, of Kiesink for one, riding for Stephen Kreuzweg, he's setting the pace at the moment, but also the riders from Fortuneo Samsic. And I'm sure we'll see one, maybe two of them start to sacrifice themselves for Warren Bargill on the slopes of the Quiet Affair. The rider at the back of that chasing group in the black and yellow colours from Direct Energy, that is Roman Sikar, another rider who's backed it up after being aggressive yesterday. Multiple breakaways for Roman Sikar. Still a really large peloton. Sky pretty comfortable with how things are going so far. They're at four minutes behind Pierre Roland, around about three and a half, three minutes, 35 seconds behind the group containing Stephen Kluzweig. But whilst they've still got Luke Rowe on the front, he is the weakest of the climbers on Team Sky. That doesn't classify him as weak because they're all really strong. But amongst that group of eight, he's the one that they first expect to be dropped on the climbs. That's why he's working early, to save the resources of the stronger climbers for the back end of the stage when it matters most. 
Right in a nice small gear here, Pierre Rollon. He's not going full gas. He keeps checking across the shoulder, hoping for somebody to come across. Quite breezy at the top of the climb as well. Not that we're going to get crosswinds on this stage, but uh, very nice cooling breeze for the riders because down in the valleys, it's quite hot. Getting up towards 30 degrees today. Here on Alpe d'Huez at an altitude of 1,850 metres above sea level. It's around 21 degrees maximum today. It's going to feel a whole lot hotter as they make their way up through the 21 hairpins of this final climb. When they went over this climb in 2015, the stage finished in Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne and Roman Bardet was on his own with Pierre Rolland chasing. Bardet won the stage, Pierre Rolland finished in second position. At the moment, Roman Bardet, he's back in this peloton, the group containing the yellow jersey of Geraint Thomas. Yesterday, Bardet, the big French hope, conceded a little bit of ground and he looks slightly vulnerable physically you could see dripping in sweat eighth on the stage he lost 59 seconds to Geraint Thomas 41 seconds to Chris Froome Pierre Roland is sitting up so really easing off on the pace taking a look back to see where the rest of that group is been holding a lead of around 20 seconds for most of this climb he'll take the maximum points here over the top of this Category 2 in the village of Montvernier. Five points for Pierre Roland. And Philippe just making sure he mops up the remainder of the points on offer. So that's three more points going to Philippe, assuming he gets there and holds off Sergio Pals. Holds him off. He gaps him. Three more. That moves him up to 84 points in the race for the Polka Dots. So he is 29 points now clear of Warren Barguil. And just hearing from our data people who are able to follow the information coming from the transponders on the rider's bike, that little black unit under the saddle of each rider's bike. And the Gruppetto is some 11 minutes behind the lead of the race. 3.7 kilometres. So the Gruppetto just about to start this climb of the La Sette de Montvernier and enjoy the uncrowded hairpins all for themselves. With Team Sky on the front, Luke Rowe setting the tempo, I can't help but wonder what Bradley Wiggins is thinking of the situation. Wiggins, the winner of the race in 2012, when he almost had a big clash with Chris Froome, he has shown his support on his social media accounts for Geraint Thomas. That's a surprise. Not. As for what Bradley Wiggins is doing now, he's been doing a lot of rowing. He's been in the boat and making a bid to reach the British team for the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Doesn't quite look like it's going to happen. He's got big numbers in the lab, but transferring that to the technique in the water hasn't been quite as successful. And Wiggins is also running and helping fund the Wiggins development team and supporting the next generation of young cyclists on their way through. Well, good to see him doing his bit for cycling and development of younger riders, but uh, definitely not uh, missing out an opportunity to stir the pot. So the, the memories of 2012 still fresh in his mind when Chris Froome was the domestic for Bradley Wiggins. And we remember that famous moment up the Perry Sword. And Froome having to sit up and then that hand signal waving Wiggins up. Come on, hold my wheel. You'll be right. Come on, little fella. Some thought it was disrespectful to the yellow jersey, whereas Froome, he wanted to go on to win the stage as they had the eventual stage winner, Alejandro Valverde, within their sights. Well, Valverde today, he's still a factor. He's in the breakaway. Consolation for Chris Froome on that occasion. Even if he caught Alejandro Valverde, he wasn't going to beat him. <laughs> but probably true as well. On his way down towards Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, where the stage finished in 2015, and Pierre Rolland finished in second position behind Roman Bardet. He's extending his advantage over the remnants of the breakaway group. Pierre Rolland is now out to 40 seconds in front. Well, at the top of the climb, he took a look back, 
free wheeled for a little bit, looked like he was waiting. But now back in the group, no one pushing the pace. So Roland deciding, well, I'm going to go on with it, and I'm going with this long range effort. He'll be glad to be out of the group and away from Stephen Kroosweik. It may lure some others out of that group to come across to roll on, on the call of quite a fair. That's where we'll start to see the race for the stage win really develop as the better climbers out of that group may start to panic a little bit if roll on gets out towards a minute. So for some of the riders in that chasing group that are there on their own, such as Mikian Nievi, who rides for the Mitchelton Scott team, who up until last year we knew as the Orica Scott team, now with a change of sponsor this year, what does he do? He just has to sit the wheels and watch others do the chasing, surely, and risk being caught from behind because he has to save energy. Yeah, let the others take the responsibility. And I would look at the team of Warren Bargill. They took a lot of responsibility early on in this stage, setting the pace, opening up that gap. So I think that will be the team to do it again in this situation. So just four riders a little bit off the front of the rest of the breakaway. I think for a rider like Nievi, sit back, but wait for, and he'll be able to identify easily which are the, the better climbers in this group when they decide it's time to go across eventually to Pierre Rolland. He'll have to make a move if he can, if he's got it left in the legs after yesterday's effort to La Rossier. Pierre Rolland, the numbers are almost falling off. Not being peeled off as what happens when you jump into the broom wagon and abandon the race. Mark Renshaw has just posted on social media that he's in the car and he's driven through kilometre zero and he already misses the fact that he won't be part of the suffering with his teammates today. It must be so hard that day after you are out of the tour. There's one worse thing than suffering in the Tour de France and that's being out of the Tour de France while it's still on. It's the Oscar Wilde quote. The only thing worse than being spoken about is not being spoken about. The only worse thing than suffering in the Tour de France is not getting the chance to suffer in the Tour de France. This is a reaction now. Alejandro Valverde is here. He's the rider in the blue colours with the red number on the most combative from yesterday. And Stephen Kruisweik is also there. He's the rider's in second position. He wants to get on with it. Pierre Latour was the rider there in the white colours, the leader of the best young rider classification. So already panicking about the lead that Pierre Roland has managed to build up as he now is just a few hundred metres away from the intermediate sprint for the green jersey points. Means nothing to him. Just another marker along the road. Interesting though, on, on this piece of road, flat, maybe just starting to go uphill a little bit. Pierre Roland not really trying to get particularly aero, sitting up quite high, that's just his style. He does sit quite upright on the bike. In the Saint-Jean de Maurienne, it's Pierre Roland collecting 20 points in the race for the green jersey. There'll be no points today for Peter Sagan. Here comes the chase behind, Pierre Roland. He believes he can make it today, and he's about to be joined. Uh, Pierre Latour, Alejandro Valverde, Stephen Kroosweik in the background, the reaction coming. One of the Kofidis riders trying yeah. to go across that gap. Danny Navarro, the yellow shoes, the only one from Kofidis wearing the yellow shoes. And of course, Bora Hansgrohe with Mullberger doing the chase because they've got Raphael Maike in that group. Hostelberger still in this group as well. He is. And at the moment, the team of Warren Bugill taking a bit more of a back seat. A couple of those riders, Warren Bugill included, riding in the last five of this group. You see how many different teams are represented in the break. All those different team cars. As Roland gets the cheers of the crowd through town. And he will be coming onto the foot now of the Col de la Croix de Fer. 18 of the 22 teams in the race are represented in the breakaway. The pursuivants, the chasers, the former members of the breakaway. Number 124 from Astana, that is Hansen. Esper Hansen, who was climbing pretty well yesterday. Unfortunately for Astana, Jakob Fulsang 
conceded a reasonable amount of time on the stage yesterday and slipped to 12th overall at 4.53. This group now starting to split up. The Spanish champion, that is Izaguirre. The white jersey with Pierre Latour. David Goudeau for Group Armour FDJ still in the group. BMC represented by TJ Van Garderen. And at the back in red, Ilnar Zakarin. If Zakarin had the legs, I thought he would have gone with 161 Steven Kruzvak. Well, still plenty of time on this 29 kilometre long climb. Though we saw that profile before, there's that little downhill section, then a much more moderate section about two thirds of the way up as well. Actual climbing, proper climbing they'll do in this climb is more like 21 or 22. This is Bargil. He's riding across. He hasn't quite found his legs of 12 months ago, but they're close to arriving. I think a good decision to let them go, not react on that flat section through that intermediate sprint. Wait until you're on the climb and then pace yourself across. It looks like he's making it. His team has done a lot of the pacemaking in the breakaway earlier on, particularly on the previous big climb of the Madeleine. But Bargill himself has been sitting the wheels, saving his energy. Now is his moment. Full responsibility for this team. It has been purely built around number 41. Well, this is a brave move by Steven Kroosweg, and I love it. Alejandro Valverde on the attack again. We saw Movistar so aggressive in the early part of this stage. With Amador, Marc Soler trying to split things up. Really putting Team Sky at sixes and sevens, but they didn't panic. They let it all happen. Just tempoed, let Luke Rowe return. Four minutes, 15. Still don't feel under a great deal of pressure. A very long climb. I just wonder how long they'll let Luke Rowe set the tempo before they start to pick it up to stop this group that's now on the charge from going any further in front because you don't chase a Stephen Kroosweg with a Luke Rowe. Kroosweg from Lotto NL Jumbo. There's a big footballer in Australia plays Australian rules football, Max Gorn. He stands at 208 centimetres tall but is a lover of cycling and he said this morning that he's anticipating Lotto NL Jumbo to be the team to take it on. Max knows what he's talking about. Well, they've got a good two-pronged attack because Primoz Roglic, he looked great yesterday, and he has just been sitting on the back of Team Sky, waiting for it all to unfold, and he'll be hoping that they really have to make a massive effort to pull that Kroosweg. Then there's maybe the opportunity to just ride in the wheels and see if he can make an attack of his own. Still a long way to go. Bargill across and straight to the front. Kroosweg then going with the pace. And Pierre Roland, he's the man out of this group, probably with the least to gain, thinking about GC. Absolutely so. These are the chases. Mikel Nieve, Rafael Maika, Andre Amador, Danny Martinez, pink helmet just in the background, small figure. Robert Heesink, the teammate of Kroosweg, he'll just shadow this move. See if they can ride across. The first two will chase, the next three won't because they've got teammates in that leading group at 12 seconds. Nieve looks as if he's making some good progress, which is not necessarily a bad thing for these four. Well, it's exactly what we said about Nieve a little bit earlier. We just wait, see who's making the moves, then you've got to go with them when you get to the quite a fair. It's exactly what Nieve is doing making the effort when absolutely necessary not a moment before he's 34 years of age he's been a stage winner at the tours of spain and italy he came close yesterday he wants the complete set of three in the grand tours this is gorka Izaguirre, the spanish national champion star this is andre amador followed then by alejandro valverde in third position is steven kruzvak it's then robert Hessink. Danny Martinez is there in the pink colours for Education First Draft Pack. Further back for that team is Pierre Roland. Gorka Izaguirre is there in the colours of the Spanish national champion riding for Bahrain Merida. Also in the leading group, Ilna Zakarin of Katusha, Mikel Nieve of Mitchelton Scots. And that rounds out the contingent of 11 riders off the front. Well, Matt, behind them, what's left of that breakaway group, the original big group, is. 
part of that group at a minute and three and another part of the group just seven seconds behind them so they're ridden out to over a minute at this point 18 and a half kilometers or so from the top of the quite affair Walt Poles 4.22 so at this stage Stephen Kreuzweig in the race for the yellow jersey has a 1 minute and 40 second lead on the road since Poole started riding on the front of this group he's taken back 7 or 8 seconds of the lead so neither here nor there at the moment status quo how do you rate the body language of Geraint Thomas as we're watching Stephen Kreuzweig he's wanting to maintain the tempo but what you've seen of Garen Thomas so far throughout the stage, what do you make of his body language? He looks comfortable enough. It's a, it's a nasty day. It's hot. There's so much climbing. Pretty hard to look as cool as a cucumber when you're sweating it out like this. But at the moment, Stephen Kroeswijk, he never really looks like he's making an effort. Such a poker face. But he's slowly but steadily riding away from this group. Quick look over the shoulder. Acceleration while they can't quite see him. Up this little steeper section. Gap opening even more. Amador trying to get back on terms. This is an attack. It's not flamboyant. It's not an, an Alaphilippe or a Bargill from a couple of days ago. Really lighting the road up. But he's just grinding his way away from this group. And looking back as if to say anybody who's good enough come along but this is how I'm going from here to the finish the preparation for Kreuzweig for this year's tour has been so consistent Reaction. here are those moves direction now coming Nievi is one of them he's the man in second position Raphael Micah was the first to go from Bora Hansgrohe Alejandro Verde. Verde it's been such a consistent season for Kreuzweig which is a good sign he's been top 10 in all the tours he's ridden, one week tours from the start of the season. Kicking off with the Ruta del Sol down in Spain, then the Vuelta Catalunya into Switzerland with Romandy, Tour de Suisse just before this. He's just been building consistently. He, he knows he can go top 10 in the three week race. He wants to challenge for yellow. This is his big move of the tour. And I really like to see him taking the risk of getting into this move and then going long range now, 72 kilometers to go. In 2016, when he was in a position to win the Giro d'Italia before he crashed, end up losing it to Vincenzo Nibali, he was also just consistent. He wasn't spectacular. There weren't big attacks. He wasn't riding away and winning stages, making it look easy. He just kept grinding away at it until he was in the lead. This is Nicola Erday now being caught by the peloton. He was in the breakaway group. We've seen the abandonment of one sprinter today, Dylan Grunewagen, teammate of Steven Kruisweig, who had nobody to wait for him and support. They've climbed 3,100 metres so far, just under 2,000 metres of climbing still to go. Another sprinter in trouble. Andre Greipel is riding with Rick Zabel and Marcel Seberg, and they are 18 minutes behind the leaders. This is Balka Mulema. Number 191 from Trek Segafredo, been doing it very, very tough over the last couple of days. Suffering from a crash and those injuries. Saw him lost, lose 51 seconds on the first day in the Alps. Even more yesterday. This race is falling apart. It's Raphael Micah who has gone across to Warren Barguil. But they're at more than two and a half minutes behind Stephen Kruzvike at the front of the race. Five kilometres to go for them. They're effectively 1K behind the front of the race. More support on the left for Sylvain Chavanel. And this is Oliver Nasser now on the front, followed by Soler and then Lander. Bardet in fourth position. Is this the right move? At the very least, what they're doing is they're dropping riders from Sky. Welt Pools has now been dropped. He's slipped out the back door. Well, I'm curious to see 
what the pace setting of Oliver Narsen will do to the gap of Stephen Kroeswag in front. That's Walt Pools on the front of this group, just been dropped out of the peloton. TJ Van Garderen, number 88. It's Michael Valgren from Astana. Michael Scher. Now we bridge back across to the main part of the peloton. Walt Pauls was with those guys. So the increase in pace by Oliver Narsen put Walt Pauls out the back. And good to see the rider in second position with the bandage on his left arm. That's Matthias Frank who went over the edge yesterday on the descent of the Comé de Rose along. Just happy to see him get back on the bike. Absolutely. Even better to see him at the front of the peloton. Six minutes and 15 seconds, the advantage now for Stefan Kruzvak. He leads the general classification by three and a half minutes. He's got looks the mask so calm. on. Just looks so calm. This climb was first scaled way back in 1947, but this is one of the best performances that it has ever seen. Kruzvak, solo, from bottom to top. 29 kilometres of climbing. As Kroeswijk goes across the top, he was climbing for one hour and 13 minutes. I said around the 120 mark. The group behind him, they'll be going at this stage for two and a half long, two and a half minutes longer than Kroeswijk. So about an hour and a quarter. This group is falling apart. Dan Martin is still there. Bob Youngles, Jakob Fulsang. Castro Viejo is fighting to hold on at the back. Soler leading. Then Lander. Bardet is third in line. Followed by Pierre Latour. Kwiatkowski, the yellow jersey then with Geraint Thomas. Froome is just behind him. Quintana is in the group. Nibley is in the group. Martin, Dumoulin. Geshka is also there. Bob Youngles and Premes Roglic is there for Lotto and El Jumbo. Jakob Fulsang and Castor Viejo. That is all that's left with the yellow jersey. Well, for all these other riders having done turns of pace on the front of this group, they are not coming closer to Steven Kroeswijk. It's been a succession of five or six riders lead the peloton up this climb and they have not worried the panel beat at all not a dint into the advantage of Stephen Kreuzweig. Initially took 12 or 13 seconds. He's since taken five or six of that back again. The Dutchman on the right of his life. Number 32, Tom Dumoulin. Also still here, number two, the youngest rider in the race, Egan Bernal from Team Sky. It was an emotional day yesterday for Tom Dumoulin. The ski resort of La Rossière, it's where his family took him to learn how to ski as a kid. His paternal uncle and auntie were part of that family trip. Sadly, both of them passed away recently and he wanted to mark their memory and their honour with a big ride yesterday and he did so. Marc Soler, he pulls the handbrake. Survival now for Soler. What can Quintana do on Alp Duez? Another abandonment. Lotto Sudal confirming that Marcel Seberg is also out. Well, you could see that one coming. Greipel gone and Rick Sabel, who was also with them. And Seberg also forced to call it quits in the Tour de France. So many riders abandoning already on this stage. Eh? Gaviria also gone. Second group on the road. 15 more points for Warren Bargill in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. He now moves to 70 points, which puts him 14 behind Julian Alaphilippe. He's getting close. And I wonder how he's rating his chances of getting to Lal Duez and possibly holding off this group. And at the back, Jonathan Castroviejo is still hanging in. The gap to those three across the top was a little over three minutes. They've lost ground on Stephen Kruzweig. 
Chris Froome. We won't even try to interpret the body language of Chris Froome. It's impossible to read. What cannot be denied is his track record of performing in the big three week races. At this is the back of the peloton with Martinez from Education First Track Pack. He was in the big breakaway of the day. Where at the moment the main survivor is Kreuzweig. Well, about another six kilometres of descending for Stephen Kreuzweig, and he will reach that second nasty little section on this descent. It kicks up a lot stronger than the section that the peloton is coming to now. That could be a place that could cost him a little bit of time at the moment. Still defending himself very well. Still six minutes and eight seconds. They are not making any ground. When they get to the base of Alpe d'Huez, we'll have to see some movement. Froome and Thomas, they can't wait forever. Well, I know as a commentator, you're not supposed to pick favourites and you're supposed to stay neutral and call the action. Go, Stephen Kreuzweig. The very neutral Robbie McEwen. He's heading to Alpe d'Huez, the most famous climb in cycling. First scaled in the Tour de France in 1952 when Il Championissimo Fausto Coppi was the winner. Let's now learn a little more about Alpe d'Huez as Froome is in conversation with his former teammate, Mikel Lander. Last three times up here, the Dutch today are aiming to take it back. They've had so much success in the 70s and the 80s on this climb, they now want it in the 2000s. This is Lawrence Tendam being caught, a teammate of Tom Dumoulin, another Dutchman. The first time the Tour de France ever had a broadcast of a stage live from start to finish was for a stage finish here at Alpe d'Huez, and that was in 1990 when Gianni Bugno won the stage. The Italian, Gianni Bugno, he backed it up a year later, winning a game. So they ride along the flanks of Le Lac de Grand Maison, the lake of the big house. I don't think there's a prison up here. At the moment, it's Stephen Kreuzweig's house. He is owning the roads of the Tour de France this afternoon. Kreuzweig is extending. He's out to 6.14, 6.15. And 3.35 behind three riders working well together. They're not playing any tactical game. Warren Barguil at the front. Then it is Nievi. Raphael Micah at the back. Keep in mind, all three of these riders have finished in the top ten of the Grand Tour. Two of them have won the King of the Mounts classification at this race. They're losing ground to Stephen Kreuzweig. And they're working well together. Alejandro Valverde now. He is in that group in between. Behind Bargill, Maker and Nieve. And ahead of the group with Geraint Thomas in the yellow jersey. It's beautiful, but it's lonely for Kreuzweig, yet it's full of opportunity. That's all that's left of the yellow jersey group of Geraint Thomas. Here is Kreuzweig, who was the virtual race leader. If the race was to stop now, he'd be in yellow by more than two and a half minutes. The hum of the carbon wheels as he's out of the saddle, trying to maintain his speed. And look at his face same neutral expression from the moment he joined the breakaway right through his attacking moment going solo over the top of the quad affair the whole time same look in control determined he's got a little over 25 kilometers to the base of the climb still a long way to go even to there how much time do you think he needs at the base of the climb one to stay the virtual race leader, if you think that's possible. Two, to be able to win the stage. If you can get to the base of the climb with three minutes 15, I think you can do it. The stage. The stage. Here's his teammate, Premier's Roglic. 
number 51, Vincenzo Nibali. Just in front of him is Dan Martin. Dan first climbed up the West as a 12-year-old with his dad. It'd be a big day if Dan was to be able to steal the show and get the win. But surely, anybody who's a neutral supporter watching the race today is on board with Stephen Kruiswijk. Oh, so neutral like me. Like you. Just like you. Well, the problem for Stephen Kruiswijk is all the other big favourites sitting in the wheels haven't done anything into the wind yet, haven't expended any unnecessary energy, and it can happen so quickly when the lights go out. So hopefully Stephen Kruiswijk is getting enough fuel on board, even maybe a little more than he thinks he needs. You really have to think your way through a move like this. It's all good to be gung-ho and open up a big gap. But you've got to think long-term about going all the way. But he still looks so good. And he's on that tough uphill section that breaks up this descent. And it's quite steep. It's so hard to find the rhythm again after descending so quickly. It just serves to highlight the brilliance of Stephen Kruiswijk. That was a strong group. Valverde, Zacharin, Roland, Hessing, Gudu, Navarro. And he just rode away from them. Kwiatkowski now at the front. While others are touching the brakes, he's riding over the top of the handlebars as if he's on a time trial bike. Bike handling skills through the roof. Stephen Kruiswijk, he's still the virtual race leader by two minutes and three seconds. The good news for Stephen Kruiswijk, that 13 kilometre section from the foot of the descent to the start of the final climb, it's a northwesterly wind at the moment, which should funnel its way up the valley, giving him a tailwind to the start of the climb. That is well in his favour. You were auditioning for a job as the weatherman when you get back home. Look out, Sam Mack. Here I come. Always. Good morning weather. I don't like getting up early. But I always like to look at the wind direction to see how it's going to affect a man like this. Sometimes we talk about echelons. But in this case, it's about defending the lead that he's got. And it's starting to drop 5 minutes 39. And he is off the descent. Before you were looking, he needs around about three to three and a half minutes by the base of Alpe d'Huez. He's got 14 kilometres or so before he gets to the bottom of the climb. This is Gessink. And then in the pink colours, it's Pierre Rolong. They're now caught by the yellow jersey group. And I think you'll need three and a half minutes. Little wobble, quit Koski, little bunny hop over a rough bit of road. Bit of a wobble. 5.38 now. I think he needs around three and a half minutes to defend himself if he can maintain the same tempo that he rode on the Col de la Croix de Fer. Can't afford to crack because then he will be caught. This was the moment on the lower slopes of the Col de la de Fer where Stephen Kruiswijk rode away from his former breakaway companions. It was a big group. Had his teammate Robert Gessink in there who had done a lot of work leading up to this point. At the start of the day, Kruiswijk in sixth position overall. Two minutes and 40 seconds down. It looks like Franz Marsen who's offering some food and some support for Kruiswijk. In the car, Franz Marsen and Jan Boven, two former professional riders. Nothing they can tell him tactically at this point, just encouragement and supplies. Keep doing what you're doing. Frozen gel, keeping it cool. And you can see on his, just behind his helmet, the base of the shoulder blades, they've put the ice pack in again. This is the group that is in second position on the road. They're now four minutes and eight seconds behind. This is Raphael Micah at the back, Warren Bargill in the middle, and Mikhail Nievi at the front of this trio. I can imagine even fans of Froome and Thomas are hoping for Kruiswijk to at the very least hold on and win the stage. They may not wish him the yellow jersey, but he deserves the stage at the very least. But sport is not always fair. He's got a huge fight to hold on to that advantage. 
If he can limit his losses over the next 13 Ks to just one minute, that will get him to the bottom with a four and a half minute advantage. The chase still being led by Kwiatkowski. He's the best descender from Team Sky. Here are the numbers on the quad affair. The average speed, 21.2 kilometers per hour. Average speed for the descent, 54.2 with a maximum speed let's round that up let's call that 89 kilometers per hour on the way down five and a half minutes now the gap so 30 seconds lost on the descent that's acceptable and they have been racing for four hours and 15 minutes, and the hardest part is still to come. The Dutch, they're ready and waiting. There's rope to hold them back. Good luck to the rope. I hope it's the strongest ever made because Kroosweik is making the race, and Dumoulin, he did it yesterday, has a chance again today. First scaled in 1952. The first mountaintop finish in the Tour de France. The first start to finish broadcast was on this corresponding stage in 1990. It's delivered so much drama. Today is the 30th time there's been a stage finish at the top of Alpe d'Huez. Just up ahead on the right of screen, that's where they're racing towards that valley. And this is the 3D map of the course. Steven Kroosweik right in the middle of the screen 50 kilometers an hour that would tell you he's riding with a tailwind at this point the peloton they're not into that tailwind section yet it's looking good for Stephen Kroosweik if he can maintain the sort of tempo he rode on the Quad de Fer, he'll be extremely difficult to catch five kilometers to the bottom of the climb take us through the climb foot of the climb the first ramps are the steepest this very first part all in black 10 percent really tough a little bit easing off after that comes and goes it's up and down with that percentage it from the red into the black and then up near the top it gets so tough in that final five kilometers before easing off with around two and a half kilometers to go it's a lot faster as you come into the village itself and what about the hairpins? Because on the hairpins, it actually flattens out. You can gather some speed in the hairpins to hit that next steep section. So it's in a really irregular climb. Kicks up, flat through the corners, build a bit of speed, next flat section, and you'll be able to look down the hill and see the progress of the peloton further down. Don't know yet if that's a good or a bad thing for Stephen Kroosweik. One thing I do know, it'll be at 100% effort from the bottom, leaving nothing in the tank maximum speed on the way down today 97 kilometers per hour for Geraint Thomas and Pierre Latour there is Dutch corner they look nervous they missed out on participating in the World Cup but this is the big one in cycling of the riders in the peloton today the fastest ever up Alp d'Huez was Nato Quintana back in 2015 39 minutes and 22 seconds. Kruzvik today, he'll be slower than that because of how much time he's spent out in front on his own. Will he stand overall? He's still the virtual race leader by one minute and 20 seconds. 150 metres until he starts the climb. All ballast overboard for Stephen Kruzvik starting the climb with four and a quarter minutes there's the sign 13.8 kilometers to go he's on Alp Duez the man from the day-long breakaway he made his move on the Col de la Quad Affair Steven Kruzweig is now under the famed Alp Duez with a four minute and 20 second advantage over the peloton and he's still the overall virtual race leader by 137. Can he hold on? Not too much holding on when you take the bid on. Steven Kreuzweig trying to settle into the rhythm. This is Vincenzo Nibali caked in salt. It's been such a hot day out there. Everybody has been suffering such a lot of climbing so far. Climbs to 25 and 29 kilometers long and finish off with this beast the salt stains on the jersey of Vincenzo Nibli is what really caught my eye. 
He's been following the wheels, sitting in the peloton, yet this has been a really tough day. And here comes the brutality of the Alp. Sky on the front. Castro Viejo going to empty. It'll then be Kwiatkowski. Bernal has moved up to third slot. The yellow jersey, 418, is still the advantage for Steven Kruisweig. He's actually gone away by a second or two. So really holding his own. Kwiatkowski, Polish champion, goes to the front now. Kwiatkowski and Castroviejo doing the work to the foot. Then it's going to be up to Egan Bernal, the youngest man in the race, the Colombian, to work for Chris Froome and Geraint Thomas. Is everyone prepared to sit there and let Sky do the work to try and defend Yellow and win the stage? Or will they try to attack Sky? Number 68, Nicky Nievi now down the back after a big day in the break. All been sitting single file for so long. Now it's about positioning, trying to get themselves right up the front, these first steep ramps and at the ready for an acceleration they expect to come from Chris Froome. Hasn't made one of his big trademark attacks yet in this tour. Let Thomas do it yesterday, who grabbed the stage win. Froome took care of the rest behind. Today, I think he wants to drop the big ones and put a big gap on the rest of his rivals. The yellow jersey group of Geraint Thomas, they're onto the climb of Alp de Wez, but they still have a deficit of four minutes and nine seconds on and, Steven Kroosvijk. And on the road, that deficit, just over a kilometre, 1.1 kilometres, the lead of Steven Kreuzweig. This is Castroviejo, his work is done, he's out the back. Kwiatkowski also been riding, he continues at the moment. Bernal in his wheel, Geraint Thomas, yellow jersey next in line in front of Chris Froome. Lawrence Tendam, he goes out the back, work done for Tom Dumoulin. Likewise for Hessink, this is Raphael Micah, 114. Nieve has also been dropped. This is Amador, he was in the break. He's done a lot of work throughout the stage and they are slowly being dropped. The next is White, number 41, Warren Barguil. It's then Izaguera from Bahrain Merida. The victims are mounting. Nothing abnormal at the moment, guys being dropped. The one's been doing the work. Danny Navarro, a little bit of trouble at the back. Tom Dumoulin stalking on the left of picture. This is Steven Kreuzweig. Yet another hairpin crossed off the list. And not a sign of faltering. Still at 3.55. Takes the inside through the turn when you're really starting to suffer. You're looking for that flatter road on the outside line, but maybe that's a good idea to help hold the momentum. So steep on these straight sections, 10%. He's not looking quite as smooth. He's riding a big gear and muscling his way up the climb. Well, always rides big gears, Kroosweg, especially out of the saddle. Doesn't often get out of the saddle. Really a seated climber. Always looks so smooth. Maker, he's gone for the day. It'll have to be another time. Jersey open for Michal Kwiatkowski. Still going on the front for Team Sky. The gap now, 3 minutes 52. Guillaume Martin at the back starting to lose contact. In front of him, the white jersey that he wants on the back of Pierre Latour. This is the race leader, the hero of the day. Steven Kruisweig took a huge risk in the early break. Others in the move asked if he could head backwards and get out of the way. First ridden this climb, the Tour de France in 1952. Fausto Coppi was the winner. It's been climbed 29 times. Today is number 30. A good indication for how the gap may or may not be closing to Kroosweg. Looking at riders at the back, who's still in contention when they're starting to get dropped, how quickly they're falling behind. Gap still 348. Kroosweg is defending very, very well. Kwiatkowski, Bernal, Thomas, then it's Froome. Roglic in the black and yellow colours of Lotto and Al Jumbo. For Movistar, Quintana is there and Lander. Kwiatkowski is now gone. Thomas is on the radio to the team car. Bernal is setting the tempo. Danny Navarro struggling at the back. There goes Kwiatkowski. His work now done. Egan Bernal on the front. He's been a question mark over the last couple of days. Heavy fall on the Roubaix stage. How much can the young Colombian take off Kroosweik before he blows? Well, he gets onto the front with the gap at 3.45. Let's measure it for when he swings off. 
Quintana's looking composed. Latua, the white jersey. He is racing to defend white. Other riders, when they're riding in support of a guy like Bardet, will punch the clutch in at that point, but he wants the white jersey. This is Bernal. And he knows Bernal may be at seven minutes behind him in this competition. But he's not confident of being able to hold him off. Bob Jungels looks to be getting distanced at the back of the group. Still in the group, Naira Quintana on the left behind him. Primoz Roglic, teammate of Steven Kreuzweig. Quintana douses himself. The black and white colours on the left-hand side of the screen. That was Tom Dumoulin. Just behind him was Dan Martin. 105, that is Bob Jungels. 15th overall. Zacharin from the break all day long in 13th position, conceding ground. Alejandro Valverde, been off the front all day, starting to struggle at the back. Simon Geschke clawing his way onto that last wheel. Egan Bernal has now taken four seconds, five seconds off Stephen Kreuzweig. Mikel Lander is looking better than what he was yesterday. On the right hand, longer can Bernal keep this up? The group contains Bernal, Froome, Thomas in the yellow jersey, Quintana and Lander from Movistar. Bardet is there for AG to Le Mondial. Roglic is there for Lotto NL Jumbo. We've also got Dan Martin, Tom Dumoulin, and holding on at the back is Jakob Fulsang. The gap, though, is crumbling. The clock telling us just over two minutes 20, but I don't believe it. We saw a shot of Kroosweg, and he still looks great. That can't be possible. This is Simon Gesker at the back for Sunweb. Most importantly for Sunweb, though, number 32, Tom Dumoulin, still looks good. There's no way it's down to 151. There's something wrong with the clock. We're going to get an update as soon as we can. Well, I think the motorbike with the tracker on it has stopped on the side of the road. They haven't changed it over to the other one. There's no way it's that. Race radio said 3.35. That's already... That's only 10, 10 seconds, seconds lost, and that makes sense. That does, because he looks so good. This is Pierre Latour battling for white. There is our clock in the top of screen, three and a half minutes. So, so far, he's lost 14 seconds under the pace of Egan Bernal. That shot of Kroosweg said it all. He still looks so good, just over 10 kilometres to go, ticking off the hairpins as they go. Berglic looks as good as he's ever looked. And Dan Martin always looks the same whether he's at the front or he's off the back he's giving it his all well as far as Stephen Kreuzweg is concerned the Nibali. longer Bernal stays on the front the better but the attacks are going to come and here it is from Nibali Vincenzo Nibali the great Italian Fausto Coppi was the first winner here in 1952 and now with the famed 51 on his back it's Vincenzo Nibali it's an emotional day for Vincenzo. He's got the black armband. That's for the former president of the Liquid Gas team where he first rode the Tour de France for. He passed away a few days ago. It's Nibali now on the charge. Nibali takes a look back, but he sees Bernal stays on the front. No reaction from Thomas, nor from Froome. They're going to let their teammate try and neutralise this one. Don't follow the acceleration. Just slightly pick up the tempo and let him fade back to us. Bernal doing the job. Froome, a little gap to the wheel, but we see that so often. He just finds his own rhythm. He closes it in his own time. And he's done it yet again. Quintana is waiting, sitting behind Froome. The initial attack from Nibali opened up 15, 20 metres, staying the same at the moment. How long can Bernal go on with this? Nibali sees the gap's not opening. That's not good for his morale. Three minutes now, the gap to Stephen Kreuzweig with nine kilometres to go. That's the virtual general classification, the right-hand bottom corner of the screen. It won't be yellow for Kroosweg and that won't concern him. It's not his primary goal. He wants to hang on for the stage victory. Nibali, that didn't look full-blooded. That looked like it was his first toe into the water. Seeing what would happen as we see the Swanier again for Lotto and El Jumbo, this time for Roglic. What will happen at Sky once Bernal is done? Well, Bernal has dealt with the first attack. Nibali swings out to the left, takes a look at the group. Come and find himself a position back amongst them. What slipstream there is at this speed. 
Kreuzweig, under 9k to go, now under three minutes. At the back of eight and a half kilometres still to climb for Steven Kreuzweig. 2.16, it's crumbling. The race computer is saying 2.26. Attack now of Nato Quintana. A quick look, an assessment. Where are the legs? Bernal still has the answer. Well, Bernal, the young Colombian, next generation, chasing a national hero of Colombia. He's been second in the tour before, but at the moment, his attack looks to be being shut down, or is it? Bernal gets to that steep section, out of the saddle now, but Quintana not going away, but Fuglsang is being dropped. Better day for Jakob Fuglsang than yesterday. If he limits the damage, he'll work his way potentially inside the top ten. 242 still the advantage for Kreuzweig. That's more like it. A couple of times we've seen that clock drop down, but it's more about which motorbike is being tracked, which is next to Kreuzweig at the moment. Quintana going on with it, but Bernal just sitting six or seven metres behind him, got it under control. Fuglsang now making his way back on to the back of the group and the wheel of Tom Dumoulin. Quintana around the right-hander. Bernal still leading for Sky. Followed by Thomas, then Froome, then Nibali. Lander is still in that group. Here is the leader on the road. He's been in yellow virtually for a while. He no longer is, but he's still out in front and on target for a stage victory. Trying to defend two minutes and 34 seconds. If he can maintain the tempo that he has since the bottom of the climb, he should just hang on. But if Chris Froome has his heart set on this stage win, with the accelerations we know he's capable of, he could mow that down in two and a half kilometres. The stage is still very much in the balance. This is Irish corner for Dan Martin, who's just off the tail end of the yellow jersey group. Kreuzweig. He keeps on keeping on on Alp Duez. Meanwhile, at the back, the white and black jersey is somewhere. Number 32, Tom Dumoulin. He has looked a little vulnerable a few times, but he's still there. The pace has clearly backed off a little because Jakob Fulsang has returned. Well, Bernal's had to react, not with a big acceleration to chase Nibali and chase Quintana, but just pick up the pace ever so slightly to neutralise them. Now backing it back off, which is great news for Stephen Kreuzweig. So in this group, Fulsang at the back. In front of him, Dumoulin. Roglic in the black and yellow. Bardet from AG to R Le Mondial. Lander and Quintana from Movistar. Nibali is there for Bahrain Merida. For Sky, they have Bernal on the front, followed by the yellow jersey of Thomas, and then the defending champion, Froome. Thomas, the yellow jersey trying to keep himself cool but now he has to throw the bottle away because they go again this time it's lander with Bardet. well with a, a reaction this time from thomas or can bernal react to this one as well he doesn't look troubled bernal just ups the pace again very slightly trying to do what he did with nibali and then after that with quintana the attacks continue to come luring more and more of the favorites out Fuglsang, he's distance again. Increase in pace from Bernal behind an attack. Fuglsang straight out the back. Bardet over the top of Lander now. The Frenchman, he starts to go for it. The big hope yesterday, he conceded more than 50 seconds, 59 seconds on Garant Thomas. It was 39 seconds that he lost on Froome. He's showing his champion character by bouncing back on Alp Duez. And he's got a gap. But the deficit at the moment to yellow is 2 minutes and 58 seconds. And he's one and a half behind Chris Froome. So they don't need to make a violent reaction to this attack by Roman Bardet. Still Bernal on the front. They reel in Lander. Dumoulin holds on. Quintana 71 is near the back. Roglic is still there in the black and yellow colours. And Nibali in red. He's tried once but it wasn't full-blooded, he still waits. Well, I'm not gonna go off the clock at the top of screen. A moment ago, it was 2.20. I'm not sure he's lost 50 seconds with one acceleration. Race computer, on the other hand, is telling us two minutes and 20 seconds for Stephen Kreuzweig. 
6.7 kilometres to go. That's at the front of the race with the Dutchman, Steven Kruisweig. Change again, race computer, 146 to this group with Geraint Thomas. A few seconds in front of them, Roman Bardet and Bernal continues the chase. 21 years of age, the youngest rider in the race, and he is blowing the Tour de France apart. So plenty of different time checks. Don't know how reliable they are. That is the latest, 2.06 for Steven Kreuzweig. Still looking good, six and a half kilometres to go. Three kilometres from the top, it starts to get easier. The gradient decreases. On to Alpe d'Huez, the stick figures come out to fights. It is Bardet laying down the challenge. Froome has not moved. He'll wait as Quintana is being dropped and Lander is not waiting for him. Overly optimistic by Quintana. He attacked, got pulled back, and now the pace of Bernal has shot him out the back. One more goes off the back of this group, and Egan Bernal, the 21-year-old, one of the fans jumping out and pushing or punching Chris Froome. This was a danger, considered a danger before the tour. Hands to yourselves, people. Approaching Dutch corner. They're doing all they can to keep the crowd back. But the enthusiasm is bubbling over. Still Bardet with the jersey unzipped. The French desperately searching for a winner of the tour. They haven't had one since 1985. The gap now under two minutes to Roman Bardet, in fact to the yellow jersey. Bardet is about 10 seconds further ahead again, and it's still Bernal. 1.51 to the yellow jersey. Quintana now 10 seconds behind that. The hopes of the Colombian going out the window. Nato Quintana, he's seized and built around the Tour de France. He will not be winning in 2018. It would take a miracle from here as he started the day already 3.16 behind. Well, Roman Bardet, as opposed to Nibali and Quintana with their attacks, he's able to hold off Bernal at the moment, and the gap is increasing very slowly. But he's making himself vulnerable to the move from Thomas or Froome. Audible boos for Froome. He ignores those. He gets on with the job at hand. The Welsh, though, they're delighted. They've got yellow. Number eight, Geraint Thomas. He's on the tip of the saddle, a long way forward. He doesn't look super comfortable. But Bardet, who would be? Listen to the crowd when Froome comes through. The French, on the other hand, for Roman Bardet, nothing but cheers. He's 2 minutes 58 down on the general classification. Stephen Kroeswag, he's holding 1.38 as he nearly gets knocked off. Gets out of the way. This is ridiculous. He's been out in front all day long. Show some respect to Stephen Kruzweig. So Bardet not bringing the big reaction from Thomas and Froome. 2.58 behind Thomas. He's 1.33 behind Chris Froome. No need to put on a big chase for Bardet at the moment. Still letting Bernal do the work behind. The gaps with just inside six kilometres to go are similar to yesterday for Mikhail Nievi. But Kroeswijk, the difference being, coming into the stage, 240 down on the general classification, sixth overall. It won't be as easy a catch as it was at Nievi yesterday, but it's still hang going. Sit up. Good or bad news for Stephen Kroeswijk? Forever loyal, Geraint Thomas in yellow, working for Chris Froome. It's Froome, then Nibali, Roglic, Lander, and Dumoulin at the back of that group. This is Bardet. Bardet around 40 seconds behind Stephen Kroeswijk. The last steep sections of this climb, still 10%. Kroeswijk still looking good, holding a really good rhythm on this steep section. The odds are now against the Dutchman. At one point out to six minutes. The crowd is closing in, but so too is the chaser, Roman Bardet. 154 metres, the gap between the two now. It's looking like Stephen Kroeswijk is going to be caught as he enters the village of Alpdewez. Thomas still chasing, Froome still talking. 
Bardet is hurting. You can see the ribs through his chest. There's nothing of him, Roman Bardet. He is built for the mountains and he's thrown everything he has at it. Four kilometers for Kruisweig and they'll feel so long because he's faltering finally. It looks like he's losing his rhythm, starting to pedal squares. And now we're seeing Lander 75 be dropped. Roglic is also being dropped as the tempo has been picked up by Froome. He goes across to Bardet. Finally, the attack but by Nibali Froome. is down. A spectator obviously involved here. Nibali has gone down. This is the danger of the crowd getting too close. Oh, Vincenzo Nibali knocked to the ground. Terrible scene on Alp d'Huez. The fans, the beauty of cycling, they get to be so close. Dumoulin rides across. The Dutch still have hope for a stage victory. Kruisweg out in front to the tune of 32 seconds. Froome chasing, Bardet drops. Dumoulin trying to limit the damage with Thomas behind him. Well, it's Froome now on his way across to Stephen Kruisweg. Three and a half kilometers to go. And Chris Froome is making his run to get closer towards yellow. Thomas will sit on Dumoulin to try and make it a 1-2, but he will not go across to his team leader, or will he? The answer is still to come. 25 seconds is the advantage for Steven Kruisweg. There's Froome, he's almost on him. It's 25 to yellow, it's a handful to Froome. Dumoulin doing the chasing. Thomas still looks good in yellow, Bardet behind them. But the hero of the day is Steven Kruisweg. And when Froome gets there, because he will, he's gone. Surely Froome accelerates straight away to get rid of Kruisweg. We're about to find out. Kruisweg, what a fight. As Froome goes up the inside, he's not concerned too much about Kruisweg. He knows the Dutchman's been off the front all day long and Froome doesn't change his rhythm. He's getting on with business. But Dumoulin, he is not cracking. In fact, Dumoulin is coming back across the gap. He's shutting it down to Chris Froome. Dumoulin wants this stage win. And Kruisweg keeps on fighting. Dumoulin, the world time trial specialist, the world time trial champion, is time trialling back to Froome. Dumoulin, he'll have his hands full with Geraint Thomas at the finish. Also pretty rapid for a man who can climb so well. But at the moment, Dumoulin defending so well, looking behind, swinging across the road now, needs to keep it straight to ride to Froome, accelerates again out of the saddle. This is how he won the Giro d'Italia last year. He rode time trials up mountains and he took time out of them against the clock. Hero Kruisweg. of the day, Stephen Kroosweg. It won't be the stage win, but what an incredible ride by the Dutchman, risking it all. Almost got the reward, still three kilometres to go, and Dumoulin is back in the wheel of Chris Froome. The gap in the overall classification between Dumoulin and Froome is 19 seconds. Dumoulin had a 20-second time penalty on stage six. Plus he lost time because of the mechanical. Froome lost equal time on stage one, so nothing separates them. Lander, Lander. now past Kroosweg. A look over the shoulder, see who else is coming. Nibali knocked off by a spectator. He was looking so good. Early attack, just putting out the feelers. Pulled back in, was in no trouble with the rest of the group, and he's been knocked off by a so-called fan. Naru Quintana, he's being further distance the Colombian. Using, losing another big chunk of time today, Naro Quintana. He goes past Egan Bernal. They're into the village of Alp d'Huez with three kilometres to go. And it's a standoff now. Dumoulin riding at the front. So Froome drops back. Bardet looks ready to try again, and he does. Hoping the other three will look at each other. Froome covers him. Bardet swings across. Froome rides tempo. Dumoulin trying to recover from that chase to close down to Froome. But number 32, the Dutchman, is so, so smart. Well, Dumoulin, he's as looking as good as any of them in this group. Able to close it down to Chris Froome, who was off the leash. He was gone. So four at the front. This is Lander about to make it five, perhaps. 
But day number 21, Froome, the yellow jersey with Thomas. And for Sunweb, Tom Dumoulin. Mikael Lander is about to make it five. Thomas talking to Dumoulin, Nibbly. What bad luck. There's nothing he can do about it now, except keep on chasing. Lander, Lander. returns. All looking at each other, nobody prepared to attack. All gone so deep into the red zone. Dumoulin chasing down the attacker Froome, but Bardet purely on determination goes again. The Frenchman, a good gap that he's open, but that's a big acceleration. Will he pay the price over the next kilometre for kicking away so hard? Froome is chasing him. The second time to the well for Roman Bardet. He is sprinting up Alp Duez. He's been second in the tour before. Froome knows he's one of the big rivals and he wants to get back to him. Well, the cheers for Bardet quickly turn to booze for Froome on the way up Alp Duez. Nibali trying to claw his way back and limit the losses from being knocked off his bike with four kilometres to go. Froome now distances Dumoulin. He's on his way across to Roman Bardet. As the yellow jersey, Thomas sticks behind Tom Dumoulin. But Tom is a tank engine and he's back to Froome. Bardet. Difficult moments, Bardet, look at the face, looks behind, sees them come back. So a big attack, but he is now paying that price. Froome tempos back across, Dumoulin goes himself. Tom Dumoulin, Mr. Consistent, is now laying it down to Sky. Thomas is trying to go with him. Thomas is there, Froome there's a gap, Bardet likewise. That will be enough to encourage Dumoulin. Well, Froome is cracking, he's back into the saddle, down the gears, trying to spin his way back across. The gap is 25 metres, under two kilometres to go. And Dumoulin now, Thomas riding in his wheel as shotgun. He won't take over. Chris Froome starts to make his way back across. And Dumoulin, he went into the red. He's now paying the price. He's trying to find his rhythm. Froome returns. Well, surely now he's thinking stage win. Not enough time to build a substantial gap, even if he can attack. Dumoulin's quite rapid at the finish, but so is Thomas. And Vincenzo Nibali is slowly closing the gap down. Well, if they all look at each other, swing across the road, there's an opportunity, maybe, for Nibali to come back, hit him like a ton of bricks over the top, and go for the stage win himself. It would be justice after being knocked off his bike with four kilometres to go. Zipping up for Dumoulin, also for Thomas. They're thinking about the sprint. Short downhill section through the village. Four in front, Dumoulin, Thomas, Froome, Bardet. The story of this stage to Alpe d'Huez, it's the never-ending story. So many chapters, so many characters, and the final page is yet to be penned. They disappear, here's Kruzvike, he's still fighting. This has been a super ride by Steven Kruzvike. And Quintana's fighting back. He won't catch them, but he's limiting the damage. This is Roglic on the wheel of Nibali. Under the bridge, little kick uphill, back around to the right. Then it goes downhill again across the plateau. So a little springboard here, little left and right as it slings its way through the village. Tom Dumoulin in control of the group not really pushing the pace this is good for Nibali to limit losses and maybe get back on terms Dumoulin at the front Thomas in yellow then Froome Bardet at the back four riders all spoken about as potential winners of the stage and the tour overall the cream has ridden to the top of Alpe d'Huez well Thomas not prepared to take over from Tom Dumoulin looking to make him lead it out, try and come off the wheel. Roman Bardet, he doesn't have a sprint in-house, but has he got one more acceleration? Maybe get himself away. Here's Nibali, he can see the neutral service car in front. The neutral service is for Lander. That's stuck behind Mikael Lander. He's at 46 seconds. The damage isn't too bad. Quintana is at 50, there's Lander. Well, Lander has made it back. One kilometer remaining. Five out in front, Dumoulin, Froome, Thomas, Bardet and Mikael Lander. And they're all thinking stage win. And Nibali coming back towards them, 
who's so cunning and he's also fairly quick. Roglic as well. This is going to be a fantastic sprint of the climbers for this mythical stage win. Etch your name in history by winning on top of Alpduez today. The final 400 metres are steep. They're really difficult. They'll get momentum into that last left-hand turn and then it is brutal to the finish. Tom Dumoulin has looked the best. He closed down Froome. Thomas unwilling to go again. Tom Dumoulin just leading them all the way to the finish. Looking over the shoulder, it's like a track race. Quintana is underneath the kite with one kilometre to go. Lander looked across. He saw Nibbly on his way. Now Lander attacks. This is a long way out. Well, this is an attack and hope for the best, but Thomas straight on it. Chris Froome as well. Bardet in fourth wheel. Dumoulin missed it a little bit. He's behind Bardet. It may leave him a gap to close. And Thomas, he's getting a gap. Will Chris Froome sit it up through the corner? Tom Dumoulin swinging wide, coming in to get the wheel. No, stays in last position. Don't be behind Bardet for the sprint. About to make the left-hand turn. From here, they can see the finish line. It's the yellow jersey out in front. Geraint Thomas looking to go back to back. An emphatic performance, not just a defensive yellow, but an extension of yellow. It is Thomas on Alpe d'Huez. The Welshman is wonderful. Dumoulin in second, Bardet in third, Froome, Lander, Roglic, Nibali. What a day. Well, what an incredible stage. Really feel for Steven Kroosweig. Fulsang now. This has been a good ride by Jakob Fulsang. He was disappointed yesterday. He said he wouldn't give up. He's lived up to his word. Well, for men like Nibali after that fall, Fuglsang, Quintana as well, even for Kroosweig, it's been a very good thing for them that that group all started to look at each other to battle for the stage win. The pace really went off. To be able to close it back down somewhat, really limit the losses. Quintana across. Sure, Garrett Thomas won the day, but Steven Kroosweig is the hero. Exceptional courage to go so far from home. He was caught near the top and he kept on fighting all the way. That was extraordinary. And how was this for a ride? The youngest man in the race, 21 years of age, his first season at World Tour level, his first Tour de France, and he destroyed the field. He's a phenomenon. Egan Bernal is the name we'll be talking about for up to 15 years to come. And there's Dan Martin limiting the damage. Martin across 145. Thomas wins by two seconds ahead of Dumoulin. Bardet at three seconds. We've seen back-to-back -back stage victories for the yellow jersey. He won yesterday to take yellow. He wins today to extend his advantage. Now, who is the leader at Team Sky? Super ride by everybody in that front group. Sky did it to perfection yet again today. Yesterday was his biggest win on the road. It's been surpassed by the one today. Alp de Wes in yellow. That is something else. He's won back-to-back -back mountaintop finishes in the Tour. Ahead of Dumoulin, Bardet, then Froome, followed by Lander, Roglic and the unlucky Nibali, the fighting Fuglsang, Quintana in ninth, and the ever-courageous Kruisweig in tenth. Super ride by Steven Kruisweig. There's
is the general classification. Quintana in ninth position. Kurzweig in eighth at 3.43. Bardet's at 3.07. Lander, 3.13. Roglic, 2.46. Nebeli just off the podium, but Dumoulin in third at 1.50. Alp Duez has been written and it's been won by a Brit for the first time with Geraint Thomas going to the top of the most famous climb in cycling in first position and extending his lead in the race for yellow. Today they head to Valence. It's a chase for the breakaway or perhaps the remaining sprinters. Yesterday on the mountain with Vincenzo Nibali tangling up with one of the spectators on the side of the road. He fell heavily, remounted, almost caught the leaders. But unfortunately, the 2014 winner of the race, he went to hospital in Grenoble. It was confirmed a fracture of the vertebrae, the T10, and Vincenzo Nibali's tour is now over. Leaving Bourg-Boisson, the stage heads off to Valence. The earlier part of the stage is predominantly downhill. It's stage 13. Might be lucky for Lawson Craddock, who wears that number. Two categorised climbs throughout the stage. A Category 3 climb early, a Category 4 climb towards the back end of the stage. And at the midpoint of the day, a sprint in the race for the green jersey. The final approach through Valence, it has some technical corners and a little climb just inside one kilometre to go. The Alps, well, they're almost behind them. They leave from Bourboison, which is at the base of the Alps, and then they continue to make the transfer right across through towards the Pyrenees. Hello and welcome to stage 13 of the Tour de France. Matthew Keenan and Robbie McEwen with you. Robbie, today is going to be a battle of morale. I said it earlier to a few people I spoke to, Matt, that this is going to be a real battle of motivation. Not only having the legs to do it, but having the willpower to go on the attack. And there'll be some big decisions to be made, whether to try and get in the break, or decide to chase it, or in fact decide to do nothing and try and recover from the three brutal days in the Alps. A number of riders now out of the race, notably some more of the big sprinters in Gaviria, Greipel, Grunewegen. So the sprinters on the left, they can put their teams to work, pull it all back together, try it for a big bunch sprint. But it's a very good chance for the men we call the rulers. The men who go on the attack on the flat roads, hold off the peloton and fight it out amongst themselves. They start by racing down through the valley of Oison and we see at the start line in Bourboison the traditional start where there's a few kids on the start line just waiting to see the big favourites for the tour, the jersey leaders, plus the most combative prize, come to the start line, and then they will get the stage underway. As for today's stage, the neutral zone, it's a mid-length neutral zone at 4.8 kilometres in length, before the flag comes in, and then we start. Stephen Kroosweg, the hero of yesterday, the Dutchman, a long-range attack, getting out to six minutes lead. Got so close, but in the last couple of kilometres before the top of the Alpe d'Huez, he was hauled back in as the attacks came from the big favourites. Peter Sagan, one of the few sprinters still in this race. A man who survives the mountains well and has a lock on that green jersey. In terms of the riders who abandoned the race yesterday amongst the sprinters, five big sprinters with a collection of 60 Tour de France stage wins between them. Peter Sagan was always the favourite for the green jersey and now is almost unbeatable. Bourg Boison, it's a beautiful town. It is hosting a stage of the Tour de France today for the 21st time. This is Balka Mollema at the back of the peloton. 191 in the white colours from Trek Segafredo. Now with the mechanical adjustment, number 182, Thomas Bouda. He's a fast finisher, not a pure sprinter, not of the ilk of a Cavendish or a Gaviria, but he might be quick enough today with the reduced peloton of sprinters. Certainly a man who can finish top 10. I still don't see him finishing top five amongst the riders who are still here. He saw him stop on the side of the road and the team car hadn't yet. So he had to just jump back on for a second, roll his way up. No real panic, that just shows you the pace of the peloton on this climb. Buda really not concerned, taking his time, getting a new bike, little push off, bike onto the roof. And he'll just try and ride his way back on smoothly through the convoy. Kupama FDJ riding Arnold Dumas pace on the climb, looking after the sprinter's legs. 
Maybe also realised that they were already pulling time back on the breakaway. Happy with it at three minutes, just ease right off. Still got 137 kilometres to chase this group of four. This is just a Category 3 climb, so the first rider over the top of this climb gets two points in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. Second place gets one point. Thomas de Ghent, who's made it pretty clear one day he'd love to win the King of the Mountains classification. He wants to get those two points, which will move him from 18th position in that classification up to 14th position, and will put him at 70 points behind the lead. But we saw yesterday there were 65 points up for grabs on yesterday's stage alone. So the King of the Mountains competition can turn around really, really quickly. No challenge coming from Tom Scully, the Kiwi, wearing number 17. He sits in second position and he'll allow Thomas to get to collect the maximum points on offer with this being a Category 3 climb. Just the two points for De Ghent. Scully in second position, Clays in third spot and Shah at the back in fourth. Our four leaders, the rider from the Kofidis team, that is Dimitri Clays. This is Mickey Shah now going through to the front. Thomas de Ghent is the next in line, and Tom Scully with the hint of pink on his jersey from Education First Draft Pack. The time cut has been one of the big talking points of this year's tour. We've seen Mark Cavendish be outside the time delay, Mark Renshaw, Marcel Kittel. Yesterday, there was two more riders who missed the time cut off. Dimitri Gruzdev from Astana, and Rain Tarame from the Direct Energy team was outside the time cutoff. And he's a guy who's clearly paid the price for being very aggressive throughout the first week. Yesterday, we also had the abandonment of Tony Gallopan, Fernando Gaviria, Rick Zabel, Dylan Grunewagen, Andre Greipel, and Marcel Seberg. Rigoberto Uran was a non-starter. Vincenzo Nibali crashed, finished the stage, fractured vertebra, is a non-starter today. 10 victims in the space of 24 hours from what has been a brutal Tour de France. It has been extremely difficult. I'm talking about those time cuts, I'm of the opinion that, well, I don't think it's an opinion, I've done the numbers. The time cuts are shorter than they have been in previous tours. It's much harder to make the time limit. When we saw the stage to La Rossière, it wasn't really short, but there was so much climbing and with a time delay of 31 and a half minutes. Traditionally, the time cut has always been around 45 minutes for that pretty average length stage of around 180 kilometres. Even we got 175 kilometre stage yesterday, it was only 41. Normally you would have expected with the average speed they rode yesterday to be closer to 48. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of latitude on the stage yesterday, and there hasn't been right throughout these mountains. Oh, well, talking of good rests needed, Le Chateau de Bon Repos. The castle of good rest. This is a former stronghold that was built back in 1470, and it was the property of the Amu family. Subsequently, it had a few owners after that, and until in 1917, the castle was damaged when the roof actually collapsed. It was then acquired by the municipality in 1976 and they created a couple of years later the association of Chateau de Bon Repo, carried out the restoration work and set it up to be able to host lots of events. The interior is open every third Sunday of the month and the exterior is open all year round to be able to go and visit. There you go, it's uh, celebrating that sign, that the flag they put on the front, celebrating 40 years of the association of the Chateau de Bon Repo. Bit of chat here at the back between Cher and Thomas de Ghent. What could the conversation be between those two? And how much hope would they be holding out that they are able to survive? It looks as if Thomas de Ghent is the one that's leading the conversation and trying to give a bit of motivation to the other guys in the breakaway. Come on, we're a chance. In the first week, the break was close a few times. Come this point of the tour, the break's chances, they increase with every little bit of fatigue back here amongst the chasers. It does. Don't think the chat was about where they're going on holiday, but probably something along the lines of, we know they're chasing already, they don't want to give us much time. Let's not really struggle against it. We ride just this tempo and see what they give us. 
and we pick a point further into the stage where we just give it absolutely everything and see how close we can get. Because if they ride much harder in the front, there'll be a reaction behind. They'll react to that increase in the pace, they'll go faster again. So you've sort of got to feather it out in the break, figure out how much they're willing to just let you hang at, and then pick a point where you say, right, this is it, 100% from here, until we either win or get caught. They're trying to swim with the current to save energy until they have to make the break and go for sure later on and spend whatever energy they've got left. This is Lucas Postelberg at the front of the peloton, the Austrian national champion, riding in support of the green jersey, Peter Sagan. Some riders in the race using the old standard brakes onto the rims, others using disc brakes. It's been a hot topic for the last few years in professional cycling and amongst those that just ride recreationally. So let's now take a look at a package about disc brake technology within the professional peloton. This year's Tour de France has seen a break in tradition when it comes to braking. Since the start of July, the UCI has authorised disc brakes in road racing and many teams prefer them to the classic rim systems. But what exactly are the pros and cons? These are actually a, a disc brake, which is different than the traditional rim brake system. Um, and a disc brake is not, not much different than what you have in your, in your car. The hydraulic, it uses a hydraulic fluid and then also a, a disc rotor and a caliper. As you pull the lever, that engages the caliper onto the rotor. And that's really it, that's how simple it is. Trek Segafredo, we were 100% disc brakes, um, except for the time trials. The big advantage of the disc brake system is that you have the consistent braking in both wet and dry conditions. It just has uh, much more power to brake. For example, in the deep downhills in the race, you can uh, start braking much later than with the normal rims. Well, the new disc brakes may be highly effective, but that itself can pose a problem in the busy Tour de France peloton. Well, the problem is that in the peloton, you've got guys who are using disc brakes and others who aren't. When there's a crash, a rider with disc brakes will stop much more quickly than a rider who doesn't have them. And that obviously leads to crashes. I just see a lot of crashes this year and uh, yeah, a lot of people perhaps not modulating the brake properly and, and really jumping on the brakes and stopping really quickly and then behind the guys that don't have a chance. Yeah. It's a different story of course, in the mountains. The weight going to be the question because the rim brake bikes are a bit lighter. I think the climbers will prepare to win or gain that uh, three, four hundred grams. But on the other hand, uh, with the disc brake, you will win uh, on the downhill. Well, Matt, it is quite the debate amongst a lot of people. Recreational cyclists want to figure out what they should buy as their next bike, traditional rim brake or disc brake setup. And we heard Dan Mart and also Philippe Madwit, the team director from uh, Buckram Merida, talking about possibly the, the disc brakes being responsible for more crashes because they're stopping quicker. The thing is that I don't really go with that theory. It's always been about the same. There's no more or less crashes than there has been in the past. There's more footage of them, certainly, from onboard cameras within the peloton. But the thing is, when you're travelling at the speeds that the peloton is doing, especially on the flat stages in this tour, rim brake or disc brake, the riders are locking up and they're skidding. You're only on a couple of millimetres of rubber in contact with the road. There's only so much stopping you can do. Rim or disc, you're jamming the brake shut to try to stop on time, skidding, and there's always going to be crashes. It's roughly the same. They are very good in the mountains, in the downhills. This is the Grenoble Velodrome, which was built in 1989. Looks like a couple of kids doing a few laps. Looks like a 333-metre track, the old style, three laps to a kilometre, rather than the, the now UCI norm of 250 metres old concrete track reminds me of my early days in cycling and racing track in Queensland on the old Chandler Velodrome which is still there right next to the Anamiers Velodrome where they recently held the Commonwealth Games but back to those brakes don't think disc brakes are at fault for causing more crashes I do like the feel of the modulation so how hard you have to squeeze and the braking power you have in the downhills and I think especially when it's wet they'll uh, be much better for safety rather than the other way around. Having a bite to eat, you could just see Stephen Kruisweik, the hero of the stage yesterday. 
Today he wears the red number, having collected, not surprisingly, the most combative prize on yesterday's stage. Afterwards, though, when he was waiting to step up onto the podium to collect that award, he looked really disappointed. And that is understandable because he put in such a brave ride. But he should be so proud of the performance that he put in. This is Primus Roglic, nearest the pitcher, having a chat with the race leader, Geraint Thomas. Roglic was good yesterday, sixth on the stage. He conceded just 13 seconds. He almost managed to stick with the big favourites. Of the riders in the breakaway, Thomas De Gent, number 174. He's the best placed in the race for the green jersey. He's in 29th position. He's on 31 points, which puts him 308 points behind the lead of that competition. Well, he could be about to get within 288 points of the leader, at least until the peloton arrives. I wonder if Peter Sagan will bother rolling to the front. Fifth place points. Won't have to make much of an effort. Fifth place, that would collect him 11 points. If he can get those 11 points effectively for free, he might be keen. 200 to that intermediate sprint. Mickey Shah rolls through. Now it's Dimitri Clays, and De Gent wants the points. He has an appetite for success all the way along the road. Mickey Shah looked a little bit perturbed by that move by Thomas De Gent. Might not win him any friends within this breakaway, but he'll settle back in and re-coordinate their rhythm. To ride behind this break and maybe just start to pick up the intensity a little bit. I'm expecting soon that Thomas De Gent will be advising his fellow breakaway companions that it's time, let's do this. Peter Sagan, he's having lunch. The sprinters, they drift back into the peloton as their various teammates will get themselves reorganized. Nice day for a picnic. Yesterday, Richie Port tried to go for a picnic. Well, he did go for the picnic. When he wanted to leave the picnic, his car had broken down and he needed to get a lift from a tow truck. When your luck's out, your luck really is out. Poor Richie. Can't take a trick in the month of July. Hopefully we'll see him back for the Vuelta. To see how that uh, fractured collarbone comes up. It's not displaced, so it's not completely snapped. No, re not required to have an operation. So pretty quickly he'll be able to get back on the bike and on the home trainer indoors. And in a matter of just a couple of weeks, he'll be able to get out on the road. They took the direct route to Volant, it'd just be 72 kilometres, but they take the long way around the outside of the town before heading into the town itself. Traverse the centre of Volant. There's a few corners to contend with inside the last three kilometres, and then the little rise at roughly 800 metres to go. The caught you by surprise this morning. It did. I was riding towards, I did a little video, I put it on my Instagram TV, and I... I hadn't checked the profile in the book, I just thought I'd go and ride it. And as I came towards that final kilometre, the road started to rise and I said, nothing more than an overpass. I came around the bend, looked further up and I said, oh, scrap that. It's a little bit more than an overpass. Confirmation, it's, it's Thomas, again, drag. Thomas again collecting the, 10, the, the 20 points. 10 points for John Degen Cole, then Peter Sagan with 9 points. Pascalon is really active from Wanty Group Goubert, and it looks like he'll be the number one protected guy from Wanty Group Goubert for the sprint finish. This is just a Category 4 climb, so the first rider over the top will only collect one point in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. Thomas De Gent, number 174, no doubt will want to collect that point. There it is, but he's not going to duck out from this group. He stays at the back. That comes as a surprise. Even though it's only Category 4, I suspected that Thomas De Gent would have gone for that point. Welsh flag to the left. They'll be delighted with the day that has been for Thomas De Gent so far because everything has gone flawlessly for Sky. De Gent will try and make this break survive but I'm not sure how we can do it with just a one minute and one second advantage Nicky Turf should get in a little frustrated with the spectator throwing water out into them then and Michael Goggles still with all those biddens in the back of the jersey he's done this whole climb loaded up with heavy heavy weight Nicky Turfstra may be thinking listen if I wanted to pour water over myself I'd just do Goggle a favour take one out of his jersey lighten the load and I'll pour it over myself thanks rather than get it chucked in my face.
just about over the top of the climb. There it is now, Tobias Ludwigsen. 102 is the deficit. Through the centre, Dimension Data. They're looking for Edvel Bosenhagen. And still sitting coolly in the wheels. Quick step floors are spotted Yves Lampard, the Belgian champion, looking after Richese. Philippe Schilbert will be up there as well. And I wonder if Schilbert may get a little selfish like we saw into Amiens and try to go on the attack on the final drag up through the kilometre. We'll find out shortly. This is the big left-hander just outside the five kilometre mark. Everybody through it safely. The squeeze is on. The peloton will start to get strung out again. They're we about to catch Mickey Share. Day is done. And all class, he goes all the way to the left-hand side of the road so as not to get into the in the way of the sprinters. Yeah, well done. Good job, Mickey Share. A good try. We didn't think it was going to work. He probably didn't either, but it didn't stop him from giving absolutely everything. Sky on the left of pitcher with Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome. He's sitting there in third wheel behind Kwiatkowski. Trek Segafredo next to them in the white with the red helmets. In the middle of the road, a little flick of the elbow from the rider from Group Armour, FDJ. That's Roman Sinkeldom who's come forward. He's the first of the riders from FDJ. Now with the fluoro glasses on, that's Olivia Legac. Sweeping around the other side in pink. That is Sepp Van Mark. Behind him was Sonny Colbrelli. Sonny Colbrelli twice second. That 86 tomorrow will be red. Super performance, Mickey Shah. Another brave ride by the breakaway. Peloton very shortly going to take a right hand turn and then into a roundabout where the map tells us passage on the right big accelerations coming this is the real fight for position after this there's not much chance to move up anymore it's the sprint before the sprint this is Kwiatkowski on the front for Sky followed by Froome and then Thomas they're simply trying to stay out of trouble Marcus Burkhardt, or Daniel Oss it was, moving around the outside for Bora Hansgrohe, searching for the green jersey, Peter Sagan. Narrow Who's again. Caught in a little bit of traffic. There he is on the right-hand side of the screen. He just emerges. Still quite a long way back. Froome says swing to this side. Kwiatkowski, shake of the head. No, we'll stay here. Follow me. Group Armour FDJ now take control at the front. That was Arthur Fischer. So they've still got good numbers at the front. Goggle. In white, Trek Segafredo, job done. Degen Kolb, he's hoping can finish it off. Zone for the riders battling for the general classification. Now they just need to avoid any falls as streamers come into the peloton and that can cause problems. Greg Van Avermaet in third wheel. He's behind Marcus Burkhart there, the gold on his sleeve. So Van Avermaet fancies himself for a sprint. He'll be a man that goes for a late attack. Probably doesn't think he can beat him in a sprint but maybe drag his way away from them on that uphill through the kilometre to go. At the front now, it's Tom Scoynes for Trek Segafredo, trying to set it up for John Degenkolb to collect his second. Strung out now in single file. Degenkolb is in fourth position, followed by Van Avermaet. Then Nicky Assant, Sepp Van Mark, Group Armour FDJ lining up behind them as they go through the right-hand turn. Out of this turn, it narrows again. They come through that shopping street. Trek Segafredo, well in control, but a long way to go with four riders, two kilometres. And there's a couple of tight turns now, a few short right-handers. Christoph moves up on the left-hand side in the white. The fight for position is on. Yves Lampard is on his wheel. Christoph is without teammates. Peter Sagan further back, but he is sticking to the wheel of Arno Demar. Demar's going to be feeling the pressure. Will he go too soon? Provide the lead out for Sagan, just like he did on stage two. Scoins on the front, giving everything he's got, trying to get them as close as he can. Kundercourt now takes over Trek Segafredo. Sturven it is, who's in second position. Degen Kolb in third. They're on the front. A long way out. Well, men at the front who like to go for a long sprint. Degenkolb, Kristoff in his wheel in fourth position. Greg Van Avermaet behind him. Nikias aren't getting in amongst it. Yves Lampart, the Belgian champion, he looks like he might, well, go for a sprint himself. Where is Richese? And behind him in pink is Taylor Finney. Yes, de Debus moving forward for Lotto Sudal in red. Heinrich Hauser trying to move his way up there on that hill. This is the drag up through the kilometre. Left-hand side dimension data. But Edward Bossenhagen, he's on his own on the right of picture. Kundakor gets out of the way. 
Jesper Sturben now slips into the slipstream. Underneath a kilometre, here comes Philip Gilbert. Called it, Gilbert was going to go. He tried it in Amiens. This is much closer to the finish and a piece of road that really suits him. Group Armour FDJ, they're onto it, they see it, but can they match him? He's pulling away metre by metre. The quick step team, they've had so much success. They've won three already. They're looking for four. The chase is on. Sinkledom is burying the head. Gilbert's onto the flat second, about to hit the roundabout. It comes with around 450 metres to go. Swings in. It now goes all the way around to the left. They've got him in their sights. It's going to be a long way to the line for Gilbert. He's not going to get there. Sagan's on the wheel of Demar and Christoph. He's looked over the shoulder. It's just about all over for Gilbert. He's now been caught. It's Guneri leading out. Now Demar opens up. Christoph is behind him. Christoph is challenging. Demar trying to hold on. Sagan is coming, the Frenchman, the Norwegian, it's Sagan, it's neither of them, it's the Slovakian. Demar went long, tailwind, Christoph tried to step out straight away, but the green jersey, Peter Sagan, he let his team do some work today, and comes out the winner in Valence. Make it number three. See them swing out of the corner. Gilbert is caught. Knows it's all over. And Demar, he takes off just over 200 metres to go. Christoph knows, I've got him covered. I'll step out. Gets held. And Sagan cleanly over the top. Half a length almost for the Slovakian world champion in green. The men we picked to battle it out at the end of today, all there. And on the form of this tour already, in about the order we may have expected. Peter Sagan gets number three in 2018. The Norwegian went close. Sagan just too good. Well, no sprinting in lanes in the Tour de France. It's not athletics, this is bike racing. The locals in Valence, the third time they've hosted a stage finish of the Tour. Last time it was the big German Andre Greipel. This time the world champion Peter Sagan wearing the green jersey as he normally does at the Tour. Well, here we see it in slow motion. Arnold Demar, the pressure of having the team on the front all day. He went from a long way out. He does like a long sprint slight tail crosswind but he did leave it open on his left hand side if there's any slip slip slip, slip stream that's where it was Christoph over the top but Sagan just too much left in the legs he survived the mountains a lot better than the rest accessing all of his speed it's not five it's three there's two more sprints to come is it a message it's anticipation this is the Rhone River that we're now getting a chance to take a look at as we check the results. Sagan from Christoph Demar, Degen Colbin fourth, Van Avermaet fifth, Lampart, Magnus Gort Nielsen, Pascalon, Cole Braley, Taylor Finney into 10. The tour is past its midway point and 152 riders remain. For those who have survived what they've encountered so far, there's no respite on the road to Paris. Today, the journey west continues. This time, it's through the Massive Centrale. Stage 14, 188 kilometres, starting in saint paul trois Chateau, making its way through to Mont. At the start of the stage, there'll be the battle to try. There's lots of climbing, no Category 1 climbs. The biggest is Category 2, but it certainly is difficult. Hello and welcome to Stage 14 of the Tour de France. Matthew Keenan with you, joined, as always, by Robbie McEwen. Robbie, the sprinters have got a battle just to survive. Today, though, is about getting in the breakaway and then what happens back in the peloton with those racing for yellow. Races within the race. And I think we'll see that again. So many riders lost so much time now through the Alps and some of the other difficult stages already on this tour. Perfect opportunity to get up the road. I think we'll see a bit of a mixed bag in terms of breakaway. And I think the stage up to Mont in 2015 when we saw Steve Cummings win ahead of Bardet and Thibaut Pinot, I think that's a good example. Peter Sagan was fifth on that stage. He made it into the break. 
but there were some 25, 30 riders or 20 riders in the break. It was a big group. But interestingly, that day in the behind the race for GC, amongst the favourites, there was a minute gap when they reached the finish line here on the airfield of Maldon. Thibaut Pinot, who was there with Steve Cummings in 2015, a former podium place finisher at the Tour de France. He's not racing it this year after riding the Giro d'Italia. He has said that he believes today there can be bigger time gaps in the race for yellow than what we saw on Alpe d'Huez. And I completely agree because that was going to be one of my lines. So uh, I'll be empty for the next few minutes uh, with nothing to say because that's what I was going to say. <laughs> This is the green jersey of Peter Sagan on the radio. Back to the team car. He's got teammates here with him. Maciej Bodnar is in the breakaway. This is Philip Gilbert rolling through to the front. And whilst Peter Sagan is in the breakaway, back in the peloton is the Austrian national champ, Lukas Postelberger. What's the atmosphere like uh, in the team with a with a winner like Peter winning three stages? Yeah, it's, if you know that he is able to win the sprint, like almost every sprint, for sure it makes a bit of pressure. But on the other hand, it's uh, always nice when the leader and the captain finish the work off you did the whole day. So it's it's really cool to be in the team with him because he's a really charismatic person and really funny guy. So we're all in a good mood and let's hope for more. We know what, what a rider he is. What, what's he like uh, as a man uh, in, at the hotel in the evening? Uh, he's a relaxed guy, always joking, always in a good mood. It's really nice. And always thanking his teammates. Yeah, that's that's true, that's true. Even when he when we mess up and if something is going wrong, he's uh, a kind of talent. He's making, uh, always looks us also nice. So he's a, a, real, a real leader. One of the great powers of Peter Sagan is not winning races and what he does after that. It's when it doesn't go right and he doesn't win. And remember a few years ago, he had such a run of second places. And even he, it started to get to him a little bit. But when he doesn't win a race, his ability to move on so quickly, put it behind him, quite often just saying, oh yeah, it's just a bike race. And he also has the knowledge that there's going to be another opportunity and Peter Sagan with his abilities gets so many opportunities because he is a potential winner on so many terrains in so many races. For the first nine stages he didn't finish outside the top ten. On one of the days where he was second behind Fernando Gaviria he was asked about the disappointment of finishing second. His automatic response was I was second it's better than third. He is definitely, he's not a glass half full guy. He's a glass almost to the brim all the time. And a lot of the time it's it's overflowing for him. This is at the back of the main peloton. Dion Smith, number 217 from Monte Group Goubert. Sitting behind the rider from Direct Energy, Roman Sikar. One of just two riders from Direct Energy in the peloton. The rest of them are in the breakaway. Well, Matt, we've spoken a lot throughout this tour about Lawson Craddock with his fractured shoulder blade. Dion Smith, number 217, broke his thumb and still in the race. They build them tough down in New Zealand. I'm sure he'd be appreciating smoother roads because they are a bit bumpy through this area, through the gorge of the Ardèche. Just a little while ago, we saw that the, the arc of the Ardèche, that rock formation over the the river that runs through and that is a prime spot for kayaking and swimming and so many people stop there it's a, a real instagram spot in this part of france one of the famous kayaking spots it runs for almost seven kilometers uninterrupted down through the gorge of the ardèche and underneath the pont de Ar. still sky at the front doing the controlling of the breakaway in the breakaway group again we've spoken about them a lot because they've been in the breakaways a lot direct energy the four top riders in terms of kilometers in the breakaway jerome cousin sylvain chavanel the fourth most fabian grillier and also 
Kalmajan, Lillian Kalmajan, all those four riders are in the break again today. And they're the top four riders in terms of time within the breakaway. There's the arc. Bridge of the arc, the natural formation. It is gorgeous. You can see why it's so popular in the kayaks. So again, direct energy with loads of riders in the breakaway. Given they've had so much time off the front, their sponsors had so much exposure, even if they don't win a stage, this can be classified as a successful tour. That love a stage though. That would really top things off. They've had so much publicity and for a French sponsor like Direct Energy as a wild card team, that is advertising that you afford to buy. The amount of screen time they've had on French TV, because also here, every stage live from before the start till after the finish and direct energy just on the screen pretty much every day. We've spoken regularly throughout this tour about how tough Pierre Latour is and his ability to hurt himself. that he finished the tour last year with a fractured pelvis. Now that is tough. Wow. He wears the white jersey, he's the leader of the best jump rider classification. Second best in that competition is Guillaume Martin. Guillaume Martin is at 1 minute and 58 seconds behind. Third is Egan Bernal at 6 minutes and 49 seconds. The one rider we know that will race for that white jersey all the way to Paris is Guillaume Martin. I'm not sure Egan Bernal will get the chance to do so because he's supporting the yellow jersey Garant Thomas, the potential yellow jersey Chris Froome. And Pierre Latour, he might get called upon to sacrifice his race for White and ride in support of Roman Bardet. Here's the breakaway. Daryl Impey looks comfortable. Impey hasn't been seen very often at the front. Just cruising along in the wheels. And the important thing to do in a group like this is do the same amount as the guy doing the least. Don't be the guy doing the least. Don't draw too much attention to yourself for your lack of effort, lack of input into the group's success. But don't be the one doing the most and using up too much energy with multiple riders in the group, like for Mitchell and Scott, they have, as well as Impey, Michael Hepburn, so he can do a little bit more work. Same with Bora Hansgrohe, it's actually Matze Bodnar who's in the group with Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan hasn't been doing a whole lot, we see him down the back of the group quite a lot. Cruising here, just behind midway in the group. But Bodnar has been consistently getting in between, filling those gaps, keeping to, keeping doing turns. Garrett Thomas, the yellow jersey, he said he enjoyed the experience yesterday. It was a real fight that he had on the stage at Alpe d'Huez, his first in the yellow jersey this year. But yesterday was a chance for him to sit back, watch the teams of the sprinters do the chasing and daydream, think long term about the prospects of potentially holding on to that yellow jersey all the way to Paris. Yellow helmets today and the yellow numbers being worn by Movistar. They're the leaders of the team's classification at four minutes and three seconds ahead of Sky. So just been doing a, a little bit of nosing around in results just to try and get an indication of what Egan Bernal might do in relation to that white jersey. A few days ago we saw him setting the pace all the way up Alp Duez, nullifying attacks of Quintana and Nibali. In the end, he finished at a minute and 41 in 11th place. So he has ridden on a bit after his work was done because the attack started with five kilometres to go. Compared to Kwiatkowski, who, when he set up after a kilometre of climbing, he lost 29 minutes. Bernal hasn't really sat up. He's kept pushing on through to the finish. Finished at a minute 41. Pierre Latour was at 4.35. So nearly three minutes between the two. Bernal does that another couple of times when we get to the Pyrenees, and he's already in white. If he was to race for white, I've no doubt for a single second that he wouldn't get it. If he rode his own race, I think he'd win the white jersey and finish in the top seven. Seven. Here's a look at the breakaway. Two riders in the move for Education First Draft Pack. They've got Martinez and Pierre Roland. Direct energy, this is Lillian Kalmajan now going through to the front. 
Bahrain Merida have also got multiple riders in the breakaway. Christian Curran now riding through to the front, the red colours. They've also got a really good climber, the Spanish national champion, Gorka Izaguirre. This is Damien Goudon now going through to the front. Christophe Laporte, the sprinter from Corfidus, working at the front. He knows he can't win today, but somebody on his team might be able to. Nicola Ede, Anthony Perez, or Anthony Turgi, who's been in good form, finishing in second place just before the tour got underway at the French Championships. It's a little bit similar to what we saw and what we said about Mate Bodnar for Peter Sagan, and maybe not too firm in the belief that Sagan can win the stage if it comes to a head-to-head -head battle on this final climb. But certainly, he can place in the top 10 out of this group. Quite possibly even a top five, like he did three years ago when he was fifth. But I do also expect to see more attacks coming out of this group within the last 40 kilometres before we get to the climb. Because a lot of riders here, they won't rate themselves a chance on the climb itself. So they'll have to find a way to try and win the race. So what's the point of being in the break if you don't even try to find a way to, find a way to win when you don't think it's really possible to do it the textbook way on the final climb and just go head to head? Moscow, not looking super comfortable at the back of the group. Number 122 from Astana. He is a good climber. He's won the King of the Mountains classification at the Volta de Spania twice. Once by one point ahead of the Frenchman Kelly Alisson. On another occasion, he wore the jersey for 19 days. And now we're seeing Alec Philippe. He is the 50th Frenchman to wear the polka dot jersey at the Tour. He just turned about Frele, and you're saying it looks like he's uncomfortable. Maybe just the start of an act. Oh, I'm not going that well. Oh, don't look at me to do too much work. And go on the attack later on. Nothing wrong with him. It's just one point up for grabs here. Alain Philippe wants it. Pierre Roland is sitting behind him. Who's setting the tempo. He's not concerned about winning the stage on his national day. He has said this is a day for Alain Philippe. He's already working for him. Almost at the top of the climb. And there'll be someone else in this group saying, don't forget, it's also a day for Philippe Schilbert. On the attack yesterday, on that final uphill through the last kilometre, getting caught with just over 200 metres to go. And Schilbert, he'll be convinced that he can win today, but I think he'll need to go away before the final climb. Up to the aerodrome of Monde. Julien Alaphilippe now comes through to the front. Roland just following that wheel, sitting out to the side, almost making it look like he was going to want to challenge, but just following through. One point for Alaphilippe in the King of the Mountains competition. Omar Freyle cruising at the back. Julien Alaphilippe, he now leads the King of the Mountains classification by 15 points. In second position is Warren Barguil. Pierre Roland, who you saw go over the top of the climb in second place, didn't collect any points as a result of that. He's in sixth position in this classification, and he is at 62 points behind the jersey. Omar Frele, he's out here on his own from the Astana team, much like Simon Geschke from the Sunweb squad. He's one of the teammates. Jakob is 10th overall. He's hopes of achieving his goal of reaching the podium dashed but he's still fighting for a top 10 perhaps a top five finish the team though they would love a stage win and Frele the Spaniard is their big chance well being out there on his own he's got to ride off the the big teams the the teams with more representation in the break he's got the biggest representation with five riders out in the break but I think to look at BMC with Kung Caruso Van Avema and I don't see Freyler able to take on Alaphilippe on the climb itself. So maybe with a guy like Van Avermaet, who has that team support and riders that would be back in that bunch to mark the rest of the moves, try and protect a breakaway as much as they can. When he does win, he wins by attacking and getting a breakaway group and then going again. That's how he has managed to win in the past. He won a stage of the Giro d'Italia last year. And this has been his best season so far with two wins. One stage victory in the Tour of the Basque Country and a stage win in the Tour of Romandie in Switzerland.
He's a guy who's, who's good in the hills. You said it, he's won the King of the Mountains jersey in the Tour of Spain, but rapid at the finish, Omar Freire. He can win from a small group. Peter Sagan can win from any group. 1.7 kilometres to go to the intermediate sprints. All giggles, fun and light at the moment with Philip Gilbert. His team mechanic has told us, and his mechanic, they first started working together in February of 2015. And Sagan likes He's taking his mechanic from one team to another. He says that the one thing Peter does every single day is check his seat height. Sagan was asked about that, don't you trust the mechanic? He says, oh no, I trust the mechanic to get things right 100% of the time. I just like to check though. Also, was one of the habits of Eddie Merckx. In fact, he not only checked it every day, he adjusted it every day. He moved it up and down by two, three. Stop during the race, move it again. You saw Mark Cavendish in this race adjust his cleats after his shoes were twisted a little bit in the crash. He couldn't quite do the full adjustment in the car park at the hotel after the stage. It needed to be under race conditions. The more highly tuned the athlete, the more highly tuned the equipment needs to be, I suppose. Simon Geschke with the beard from Sunweb. Andre Amador is the rider in the blue colours of Movistar. Well, the other thing is, when you get a new bike like these riders do, pre-Tour de France, pretty much every team, for their riders who are in the Tour, new bikes across the board. Everything completely brand new. As you go on, the saddle over days and weeks softens just a little bit, and that affects your saddle height when you sit on it. It might look the same and measure up the same on a jig, but when you sit on it, you might lose a millimetre or two as the weeks go on. So just feel that little adjustments as we are just 200 metres from the non-sprint sprint. sprint. Here's an acceleration. The Buddha, others want Buddha to is run to second challenge. first. Buda wants to take something. Throw for the line. He didn't really dare pass him, just wanted to make sure he got second, Buda. He would have liked to have gotten in front of him, and that's the first time we've seen Thomas again in a breakaway, not collecting the points. Maybe a question from Sagan. Hey, why did you uh, make me ride so hard for that? You saw Boudart with the two fingers. No, I just wanted to make sure I got second. He's a top 10 sprint finisher, Tom Boudart, but he's not a top five sprint finisher. And where is he in the green jersey competition? I'm looking a long way down and am struggling to find him. He's in 22nd position. He is on 32 points while well, he was at the start of the stage, which had him at 363 points behind Peter well, he Sagan. will have added 17 points to that total, so maybe moved him up, himself up a couple of slots. But that was pretty much to expectation. I'm actually a little bit surprised that there was that much of a push for Sagan to go through there in first place. Also, Yves Lampart making a little acceleration. He's not up there in the green jersey competition, but just can't help himself probably also knows he's not going to win this stage because he's got Gilbert and Alaphilippe in the group. Try and get a little something for himself out of it. He's the workhorse in the breakaway for Quick Step. We have three riders in the move, along with Yves Lampart, as Robbie just mentioned, Philippe Gilbert and Julien Alaphilippe. Well, we're inside the final 100 kilometres of this stage and the gap to the breakaway out to 7 minutes and 10 seconds. The 32 riders off the front. And if you've just tuned in to join us within this last 100k, well, this all formed very early in the stage. Saw the crosswinds blowing down the valley, hitting the riders from the right-hand side. A big split in the peloton. In fact, four or five groups on the road. Team Sky all up the front. Plenty missing the cut. And out of that front group formed the breakaway of 32. Team Sky sat up, took things a bit easier, but under control. All the other GC contenders returned to the peloton. And since then, this 32-man group have just ridden steadily further and further away from the Sky-led peloton. Well, the graphic... Always very positive, Simon Gerrans, but from what you heard from him before the start of the stage, he wasn't making any of the noises of a man that was going to try and get into the breakaway today. 
figuring pretty quickly that that final climb would be too steep for him just about regardless of the composition of that breakaway but it can't be forgotten that when Gerrans first won a stage in the tour back in 2008 it was to the top of the climb of Preto Novozo just across the border in Italy it was from a breakaway group of around about five riders surviving towards the end of the stage and Gerrans outsmarted them and outmuscled them to win the first of two stages that he's won in the tour the other one came in Corsica in 2013 when he won a sprint finish being led out by Daryl Impey getting the better of Peter Sagan well you just mentioned about Simon Gerrans not making the the noises of a man who sounded keen on a break today and I just was looking through the race book and thinking of the qualities of Simon Gerrans and I think tomorrow to Carcassonne and the day after to Bagnier de Luchon a definite chances for Simon Gerrans the type of stages he has won in the past so maybe just choosing today to sit back make sure he's fully recovered from going through the Alps fully recovered or as recovered as he can be freshen up as much as is possible and you averaging around 180 kilometers a day in the Tour de France after two weeks of racing and get himself in the break on one of those stages Primoz Roglic at the moment sitting fourth overall at two minutes and 46 seconds behind Geraint Thomas in the race for yellow and Roglic last year and we saw a fantastic solo stage win over the Galibier and into Ser Chevalier to so the ski station where he would have been in a former sporting life last year on the bike showing he had the power uphill and the daring downhill it might have been quite a job to develop those descending skills that we saw that horrific ski jumping crash that he had during his junior ski jumping career and what a career change it's been it's an incredible transition from ski jumping to cycling but if he can do ski jumping nothing will scare him on a bike that can you imagine the fear at the top of one of those slopes and they go down there jumping 90 meters or so at the elite level olympic games gold medal level i can imagine it i'm not going to find out for real what that fear is like because i'm not going to go stand at the top of one and slide down it and jump off the end the greatest story of transition from a winter sport a winter olympic sport through to professional cycling is that of the american eric hyden I would say that Roglic's transition is bigger from ski jumping to GC contender in this year's tour because ice skating, but it's that real endurance athletic performance. So he already had the engine and he knew it. Roglic came from ski jumping where you don't need particularly a big engine. It's daring its technique above everything else so it would have been an even bigger switch for him to discover his athletic prowess in endurance sports I agree on the contrast of the switch but the story of Eric Hyden is one that just fascinates me. oh it is phenomenal no doubt five gold medals at the Winter Olympics in speed skating in 1980 then transitions to become a professional cyclist with 7-eleven under the guidance, mind you, of Jim Okovic, who is the general manager at BMC. He rode the Tours of Italy, he rode the Tour de France. Then when his professional cycling career was over, he went on to complete his medical degree at Stanford University. Well, I would say, check out the big brain on Eric. with cheese metric system Luke Rowe at the front along with Gianni Moscon and the picking order in the peloton so it goes based on riders in the general classification Sky at the front then Sunweb then Lotto NL Jumbo then Movistar out to 9 minutes and 15 seconds sky have backed things off even a little bit more since getting back rolling after that big nature break they're saving some resources they know the best place rider in that leading group caruso is 39 minutes and 18 seconds behind 
number 215, stretching the lower back at the rear of the peloton. That is Johanna Fredo. He was in so many breakaways in the first week. Just a little tap on the backside there for Laurent Pichon, who a couple of days ago celebrated his 32nd birthday. Well, if the breakaway with Damiano Caruso was to win by 10 minutes, he'd move himself into the top 20 overall. He'd take 20th position, which is currently occupied by Rafael Maker. Peter Sagan. Oh, teammate of Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan at the back as they're about to start the climb. Daniel Loss tells the story of Peter Sagan's love for riding a bike. And they were at a training camp in Utah. They'd been out for five hours on the road. They got back to the team hotel. Oss went off for a shower and a massage and just wanted a bike to eat. Peter Sagan saw the trails and he went out for a mountain bike ride. And whilst he was out on that mountain bike ride, he had a lot of fun. He captured a fair bit of it on video and shared it online. When he shared it, he didn't bother mentoring the fact that he'd been out for a road ride and he'd done 3,000 metres worth of climbing. There he is, the green jersey, Peter Sagan. There's not much he can't do. Simon Geschkit just wiping the sweat out of his eyes and off his brow. He may be a guy who's prepared to take on Alaphilippe on the final climb of the day, but I wouldn't imagine he's got the punch of Alaphilippe to really match him. Maybe he is a guy who could go on the attack on this Cat 2, followed by Category 3, uncategorised climb, try and build a gap. If he's got a gap at the final climb, he's certainly a man who could defend that, ride quick enough up this final hill to hold off the likes of an Alaphilippe on the charge. Direct energy, do they start to make the move? They've got the most numbers in this group. They have five riders in the breakaway. This is Jerome Cousin now riding towards the front. Peter Sagan in the green jersey, dominating that competition, having won almost 60% of the points available so far throughout the race. You just spoke about direct energy. One on the front end, Jerome Cousin. The other four are all at the back of the group, as is Julian Alaphilippe now. So with 3.8 kilometres to the top, he'll want those points, but he's got plenty of time to move his way back through the group, and get up there and take them. While Damien Godin on the left, well, he can hardly find a bigger gear. He's, he's a, not known for his souplesse, as they call it in French. He's a man for the flatlands. He has been a winner of a very short prologue at Paris-Nice, collecting the first yellow jersey of that race. Fifth place finisher at Paris-Roubaix as well. That gives you a bit of an indication as to the style of rider he is. But he's done so well to get into the breakaway today. He's helped drive this group, and he's given other riders on his team a chance to win the stage. Also down towards the back was Lillian Kalamajan, who isn't looking as good as he did 12 months ago when he did manage to win a stage to Station de Russe. But perhaps he's just been trying to lull everybody else in that breakaway into a false sense of security, looking as if he's struggling a little bit more than what he might actually be. Incidentally, Lydian Kalmajan's in 30th position overall, sitting at 52 minutes and 40 seconds behind. The first of our moves, and it comes from the Spanish national champion, Gorka Izaguirre. Not a violent attack. This is a sneak attack. He slides off the front. I'm wondering who is going to react to this. With so many riders up there, so many teams with multiple riders, will there be a little bit of looking around? Well, why don't you shut it down? Huh. Why don't you shut it down? You've got as many as us, or you've got more than us. You do it. It might start to look at direct energy. They can afford to sacrifice riders to go on the chase. Julian Alaphilippe looks like he's waking up at the back of the group. He wants maximum points. He doesn't want to see someone like Gorka Izaguirre get too far in front either. Perfect time to get it started. Izaguirre, good tactic. And he's not going full-blooded. He's got the look of a man who wants to have somebody else come out there with him. 
and support his bid to try and stay at the front and get away from some of the other riders in this group and increase the odds of him being able to win the stage. Here he is, Gorka Izagira. His brother, Jon Izagira, is in the race, riding also for Bahrain Merida. He was a stage winner to Morzine two years ago. He'd like to join him with a stage victory at the Tour. And with an advantage of 9 minutes and 56 seconds, this is the biggest gap we've seen for any breakaway in the Tour so far, surpassing that of Stage 7. Meanwhile, in the peloton, we're just hearing over race radio that Luke Rowe has a mechanical, needs a front wheel. I wonder if Sky will back it up. They will because it doesn't really matter. Damiano Caruso, best on GC, 39 minutes behind. So he's now within 29 minutes of the yellow jersey of Geraint Thomas. Panic stations, not quite for Sky. No, won't have him quaking in his bike shoes. 26 seconds. Is a Gira. Spaniard from the Basque Country. We head towards the Basque Country at the back end of this race with the final individual time trial down towards the Spanish border. Here is Is Aguera. Number 54, Jon and Gorka Izaguera. Their father was a cyclocross national champion of Spain. Didn't quite reach the heights that his sons have managed to do so in the professional peloton. And I can just imagine how proud he is watching his boys in the tour with one of them now, Gorka, off the front on the hunt to join Jon as a stage winner at the tour. And incidentally, Gorka is the... And there's nothing more motivating than have your younger brother achieve something that you want to achieve. Try and hang in. At the Spanish National Championships this year, it's evident that he won the road race. He's wearing that jersey. He was also second in the time trial of the National Championships. Not a rider you want to give too much time to. This is a reaction coming from Tom Yelta Schlachter of Dimension Data. Well, Thomas de Ghent was easing his way out of the saddle a little bit further back down the road. And let's see what Julian Alaphilippe is prepared to do. Try and take some points here at this Category 2 climb. Does he jump across to Tom Yelta Slugter and just nab the point? Settle himself back in or try and go across? I think Alaphilippe, as the favourite, the best credential to win on a climb like this, we've got as the final climb, tops out 1.7 kilometres to go. He'd be better off sitting back and letting Lampart do more work. It'll all depend on what Philip Gilbert is prepared to do for Alaphilippe, if anything at all. Over the top of the climb with the Col de la Croix de Bethle, and it is Gorka Izaguera in first position. Just the second time in the history of the tour, and the locals have come out in huge numbers. Schlachter, when he made his move, the gap was over 30 seconds. Headwind at this point on the climb. He's looking for company, but the best company for Tom Yelta Schlachter is out in front in the shape of Gorka Izaguera. Here's the rest of the group with Alaphilippe, also with Gilbert. Alaphilippe, third across the line. Philippe Gilbert. So two Philippe in the race for the polka dot jersey. Michael Hepburn still here in the back of the group with the wheel of Peter Sagan. Damien Godin grinding that big gear as always. Last man of the group. Is a gear there on this short, shallow descent. And he'll be able to look across and see what's happening in the group behind him. And out to an advantage of more than 11 minutes on the peloton. This was the move by Gorka Izagira. It wasn't the just roll off the front that we saw from Steven Kruzweig on the stage to Alp Duez, but it wasn't a violent attack by Izagira. No, just a smooth attack, carrying speed. Rolled on away. Once he got that little gap, just picked up the intensity again. Bit of a sly one. But they can't say they would have been completely surprised. I mean, it wasn't going past doing two to their one. Need to jump and go with him. Others look like they consider it still too far to go. We'll see at the end of the day if they've made a huge mistake. Back 
of the group, number 201, is Christophe Laporte, the sprinter of the Cofidis team, selected for this tour over Nassar Buhani. Well, I guess we'll see in the upcoming Vuelta. We fly high above Le Mont Lozère. And here in the massive Centrale, we're not too far away from the Puy de Sancy either, which is the volcano summit here in the massive Centrale. And it is in this area where you see so many of the volcanoes in France. In the plateau, it gets up to a maximum altitude of just over 1,800 metres. So not quite the high mountains that we see when we go through to the Alps and through to the Pyrenees. Gorka Izegira in Salsti, the third name that you see there is his mother's maiden name as part of the Spanish naming conventions. But when making reference to him, it's generally just the Gorka Izegira part. Which is good for us because it's quite the mouthful. It is. Had a good start to the season. He kicked off at the Tour Down Under where he finished in seventh position overall. And then we've spoken a bit about rivalry between brothers like Gorka and his brother John, the Yates brothers as well. At Paris-Nice this year, Gorka finished in third position, so he got onto the podium. His brother, Jon, was fourth, two seconds behind him. So it was a battle between the two brothers, also riding as teammates, to get a spot on the podium at Paris-Nice this year. Incidentally, that was won by Mark Soler, with Simon Yates, the twin brother of Adam, in second position. So here are the time gaps, and Tom Yelta slacked it with y Jasper Sturven now. Signalled at five seconds behind his gear. So this will be them riding into shot. Three, two, one. A bit slow on the countdown, but pretty close. And Izagira was aware of them coming. He just backed off the pedals a little bit and he was having a bite to eat before they get there. Refuel. Well, this is now perfect for Gorka Izagira. This is exactly what he would have wanted. Tom Yelta slugged it, slides into third position, gives a quick yell to Izagira. So you jump in on that wheel and follow Sturven. And Sturven with nothing to lose. Goggle is a more of a climber than Sturven from Trek Segafredo. And he's riding away from the others at the moment, Sturven. And, but Sturven will go for his own chance because Goggle back in the group, he's not going to be as good as Alaphilippe and probably about 10 of the others up this final climb. This is Jasper Sturven having a go at the stage win. He knows he needs to build a big gap coming onto this final climb. And he's got the terrain to do it, a category three climb in front of him. The next climb, the Col du Pont sans eau. The mountain. There was plenty of water on it last night. It was pouring down through here. It was on top of the bridge, not under it. Well, it was under it too at that point last night because it was absolutely torrential was all over it. Now these two are really having to work and they're losing ground on Jesper Sturven. They're still just 28, 30 seconds in front of the chasing group, which is a group now of 28 riders. Sturven now sitting up, looking behind. So better for him to wait for those two and all work smoothly together. Another attack off the front by one of the riders direct energy. I think that's... It's not Chabanel. It's not Lillian Kalmajan. It's got to be Cousin. Yeah, because Damien Goudon was getting dropped and also Boudin was struggling towards the back. The advantage of having five riders in the breakaway. Plenty of cards to play. So some data of Gorka Izegira against Alaphilippe on the climb. You can see a tiny difference, 0.4 of a kilometre of an hour because Gorka Izegira attacked around a kilometre from the top of that climb. Whoa. The peloton's still a fair way to go to get to the top of the climb. Nice one, and Yes, for Sturven. This is good news for Gorka Izegira. Sturven, the powerful Belgian, on the front, really giving it everything on the descent. This is a part of the course where he can help this group build up an advantage. But look at the by comparison to the other two who were more noted climbers. Look how low he's got to get, tucked down over the handlebars to get a slipstream behind Tom Yelta Slugter. 
probably 25 kilos less than Jasper Sturvin. Nah, slight exaggeration, but you get it. Now Direct Energy having to do a lot of the chasing. Red colours going forward. I imagine Thomas again will want a piece of this action. 30 seconds, 13 minutes back to the peloton. Without question, somebody from the breakaway will be winning the stage. There's a few riders in there who have tasted success before. Simon Geschke is a former stage winner. Ala Philippe, Philip Gilbert, Lillian Kalmajan, Sylvain Chavanel, Greg Van Avermaet also in there, a multiple stage winner at the tour. Pierre Roland likewise. They want to add to their list of successes, throw Thomas de Ghent into that group as well. Others just want to join them to say that they've been a stage winner at the Tour. Race Radio telling us that the lead group has 25 seconds on the chase at the moment. So the reaction coming. And it's windy through here. You can see it howling up through the valley. The good news for these three is, is they're about to make it on to the Pont saint eau the climb of the bridge with no water. 2.7 kilometres to go before they get to the base. Sturvin doing a lot of work on the way down. Maximising his time gains while it's on terrain that suits him a little bit better. But Sturvin has been climbing well. In fact, he sits in 62nd position overall and an hour and 24 minutes behind. He's been really under no pressure in the mountains in terms of a risk of being anywhere near the time cutoff and being eliminated from the race. And for a man of his size, it shows that he's got plenty of power under the bonnets. Well, I think back to him winning Kuna Brussel Kuna in Belgium in the spring a couple of years ago holding off a chasing peloton incredible power and for a while in Belgium they were and I know it's happened before and talks cheap but they often spoke about him as the next Fabian Cancellari hasn't got to that level yet but don't say that he won't it'll be at a, a later time in life than Cancellari started winning tour stages and dominating in classics but uh, Sturvin certainly a very strong rider and one they may have made a mistake to let go and already have 30 seconds especially with uh, a bit of assistance they're in fourth position in the blue colors the wind is a factor a bit of a breeze up the top and we've mentioned going up to 1246 meters above sea level and seeing the helicopter shots that we've had getting right up to the top of these climbs it does get quite open it's not going to form an echelon, but it just makes it more difficult. And if you're on a climb with a crosswind and you're stronger, you can put it into the gutter and get rid of a few more. Give them no coverage on these faster climbs where they could benefit from a bit of a slipstream. Lampart followed by Stefan Kung, and then smartly up into third position is Lillian Kalmajan of Direct Energy. He's the one rider from that team with five riders in the breakaway who has spent the least amount of time on the front and the most at the back. He's at the business end now. The others have been working for him. He has the responsibility to finish it off. Now you would have thought with five riders in the break, it would be impossible to miss the first attack. But Goudin was already on the ropes. Buddha was also dropped pretty early on when the pace went on, so they obviously weren't capable of that. The other three though, Cousin, Kalmajan and Sylvain Chavanel with all that experience of 18 Tours de France. Top of the climb, the bridge with no water. It's Jesper Sturven. There's no challenge from Izaguera. Nice pair of hands from Tom Yalta Schlachter collecting the bid on. Well, he's found some water at the top of this one. Izaguera smartly not challenging for any of the points for the King of the Mountains jersey. Not interested. Wanting to keep the cohesion. It's now Thomas de Ghent who comes to the front. Lampart is gone. He's further back in the group about halfway. Looks like he will be able to stay there and then be of more use to Alaphilippe and Gilbert down the other side. So the injection of pace now by Damiano Caruso. Philippe Gilbert himself increases the tempo at the front for Julian Alaphilippe. It's pretty clear who the number one is then for Quickstep. Gilbert working. Alaphilippe 
No points for the King of the Mountains jersey on that occasion with three riders off the fronts. Andre Amador comes through, Danny Martinez as well. So you can see the urgency in this group now. They are worried about this group up the road. They put so much time into them up to a minute. Peter Sagan on the back of the group. He's been hanging around the back of this group for a long time. But as other riders go out the back, he just dips around, fills the gap, stays in that position, and he'll let himself get dragged all the way in towards Monda do his best from bottom to top see where he comes out three years ago fifth on the stage also there at the back same sort of strategy Greg Van Avermaet inside the last 45 kilometers this is what's happened so far on the day as soon as the flag came in the race was under serious pressure with the crosswinds it split into four groups then at the front of that, we saw more attacking, not surprisingly, Sylvain Chavanel, uh, along with Thomas de Gens. As a result of that, a group of four went off the front. That swelled to seven. It then became 32. On the previous climb, the Spanish national champion, Gorka Izaguera, he launched an attack, tried to tease a few other riders out to join him, and that's exactly what has happened. It's now three riders off the front. It is Gorka Izaguera, the Spanish national champion, along with Tommy Altaschlachter from Dimension Data and Jasper Sturban of Trek Segafredo. What was left of the breakaway is starting to split under the pressure of Quick Step. Lampard has done his work. Gilbert is also setting some of the pace. Out of Philippe has the King of the Mountains jersey on and clearly wants another stage victory, but he's got some stiff competition. The three leaders. Yes, Sturvan, when they go downhill, he is the man to tow them away from their former breakaway companions. And actually having trouble following his wheel. This is the rest of the break. It's been reduced in number from its original 32. Three off the front and around 18, 19 riders left chasing behind. And the peloton at 14 minutes and 15 seconds is more than nine kilometers behind. Race computer tells us that is a 19 man group chasing behind these three and they got them back to around 38 seconds on the last climb. The difference now gone back out to a minute. Jasper Sturvin on the downhill, he is proving to be the difference. And trying to work out in that group of 19, who does the chasing? They need Eve Lampart to return to that group. So they descend for just a little bit longer, then they start climbing again. It's not a categorised climb, but it is equal to the previous climb that we just saw. All three really sharing the work well together. Out to a minute and eight seconds now in front of that chasing group of 19. These narrow, twisting roads are great roads for a breakaway to survive on. Well, they favour a three-man group who's prepared to give their all together over a group like this where there's still a lot of riders trying not to do much at all. Like Pierre Roland, number 16 at the back. Philip Gilbert in the blue colours. He's gone back. He's obviously talking to Pierre Roland, something along the lines of, there's two of you, yourself and Danny Martinez. Can't one of you help with the chase? Or maybe, hey, listen, there's a gap that I don't think will get closed just chasing. What about you and I go across on the next climb? And just quietly, I'm asking you to go with me because I know I've got you covered on the final climb. I'll beat you at the finish. Action in this chase group now. Sagan is now going out the back with his teammate Bodnar, along with Michael Hepburn, Yves Lampart, Julian Vermont, the rest of the direct energy team, pretty much. And this is the climb that is not classified, and it is more difficult than the previous two that have been. Plus, it is exposed, and there's a crosswind to deal with, and the chase is splitting up. Well, Here are the three leaders. It's got to be Alaphilippe and Gilbert that are behind this acceleration because they'll be starting to panic once it went back out over a minute. They used Yves Lampard, got it into 38 seconds, got on the downhill, and mostly down to Stoven, <laughs> towing these two in his slipstream, got it right back out. There is a battle on here just to stay in the front of the race. But there's the answer to your question. This is Amador being dropped, but at the front, Thomas de Gens, Julien Alaphilippe, Philippe Gilbert. 
in this next group. Perez is in the red colours of Kofidis. Greg Van Avermaet is fighting and trying desperately to survive. Daryl Impey is also tagged on towards the back of them. The green jersey, Peter Sagan, will not be winning today. It's not often that you get to say that. Also doesn't look like he's completely giving up and getting himself over the top of this and onto that, that downhill, maybe to ride himself back onto one of these chase groups and they might all sit up, get himself back in contention. This is Kalmajan in front of Daryl Impey. In the black colours, Kalmajan, he has been the number one man all day for Direct Energy who have had five riders in the break. Gilbert is now under pressure. Next in line, this is Ede from Cofidis. Martinez swings out. So Roland's not going to help that group behind. He's got a man in front in Martinez. Caruso. Damiano Caruso, Simon Geschke, Alaphilippe, De Gent. And Frele, number 122 from Astana. This is a quality group. Their gap to the three leaders is closing. It's down to roughly one minute. Ezekiel, the Spanish champion at the front. Sturven in second position. Yalta Schlachter at the back of the group for Dimension Data. There's still some climbing to do, and Izaguirre is, is concerned about a few from the break returning. But they are making a massive effort behind. That has been a full-on attack from the group behind, really splitting things up. And the question is, can they keep that tempo going or will it plateau? And then they all start to look at each other about who's going to do the bulk of the work to chase this group. Really that concertina effect, they come closer, then they drift further away. And if they don't make a really big impression over the top of this climb, I'm backing with the power of Sturven for them to go further away again. This is the finish. Le Rodrome de Monde. That's the destination for the fifth time in the history of the Tour de France. The first was on Bastille Day in 1995, and it was a Frenchman who won. Sturven, he's been doing a huge amount of work. In fact, they all have been. Not sure what the exact breakup is, but there hasn't been anybody trying to sit on and start to play the tactical game. This comes back to the time cut situation and what the organisation have been projecting at normal average times or projected times for the stage finishes. I think they really need to have a rethink and a recalculation on all fronts. At the moment, as they head along the valley road in towards Mond, it is a headwind for Jesper Sturb and it's now switching as he weaves his way around. Remember, 10 kilometers per hour is the wind. It's 22 degrees. There's been a little bit of cloud cover throughout the day, which has provided some respite from what's been a very hot start to the Tour de France. But Jasper Sturven, this is a bold move. But we've seen how quickly riders can fall apart on a big climb. The good news for Jasper Sturven is although it's a tough climb, it's not a long climb. It's three really hard kilometers. But it is a climb that takes you about nine minutes to do. The record on the climb is held by Marco Pantani back in 1995, which was around about nine and a quarter or nine and a half minutes. They'll be going nowhere near that time of Marco Pantani today. Nowhere near. Well, the Strava record, and doesn't mean it's happened in a race at the end of a long, tough day or two weeks into a Tour de France, is held by Thibaut Pinot and we've heard his projections for this stage and what he thought might happen just over nine minutes 916 I think it was the time for Marco Pantani in 1995 was nine minutes and three seconds 23 years ago 7.3 watts per kilogram is the estimation on that from Marco Pantani Thibaut Pinot, 9 minutes 26. My time this morning, 14.28. Jesper Sturven will be nowhere near the time of Thibaut Pinot, and he'll be nowhere near your time either. He'll be well, well in front of mine, but I reckon he'll be about a minute and a half slower than Thibaut Pinot. And that's why Julien Alaphilippe will be quite comfortable if he's within a minute when they come into Monde. The Sunweb team. 
protecting the third place ride in the overall classification. Tom Dumoulin, he's 150 behind the yellow jersey of Thomas, 11 seconds behind the defending champion Froome. Education first trap pack with number 16 at the back of the group, that is Pierre Roland. And those four have been caught. There's Thomas de Ghent on the left in the red colours from Lotto Sudal. Now Tom Yelta Schlachter is about to be reeled back in. So it's one rider off the front with an advantage of 1 minute and 14 seconds. Jasper Sturven could be on the way to the biggest victory in his career. Well, the Belgian on the day, July the 21st. Whether he can draw some inspiration from that or not, it is an inspired ride. By the man from Trek, Sigafredo, classic specialist at home on the cobbles. But today in the Massive Central, at the moment, looking like he could be on the way to his biggest victory of his young career. Philippe Gilbert, front of the group, no concerted effort, the hand signal, come on, let's swap turns, everybody a turn at the front, but there's now plenty of passengers. Great news for Jasper Stoven. here he is. He needing those too often anymore, he just needs to screw his climbing legs on. Well, he's shown so far that they're working quite well to be able to go across to Gorka Izagiri. Also helping to drive the pace on those couple of climbs as well. But it's been particularly on these downhill sections. He's a big man. A lot more momentum and a fantastic time trialist. On the stage into Compare, he finished 28th whilst playing a support role to see if they could get John Degenkolb up there and also looking after Balka Molima. That was a shorter climb, much shorter than this, but it required punch and a real good kick. Inside the top 10 were a lot of the contenders for the overall classification. So this climb, it's not one of the pure big mountains, but it could be a day where Jasper Sturven can defend his advantage of a minute and 15 seconds. He lost a huge chunk of time on the stage to murder Bretain. He was caught behind a bit of traffic and once he conceded ground, he really did let the wheels go. That climb of Mur de Bretagne is a little bit more comparable to today's final climb. Oh, this one, twice as long. In fact, the really steep section on Mur de Bretagne is just one kilometre. This one is steep for three. And the hardest section of the climb is between three and two kilometres to go on the stage. The top, of course, at 1.7 from the finish. Cathedral in the heart of Mond, that is just in the distance. The Cathedral of Notre Dame is Saint Privé. This one goes back to 1368, and they'll ride past it without even noticing its presence. They might see it after the stage on the way back down the hill, but for now, it can wait. Well, for Jasper Stoven, it's all about concentrating on his own suffering as the gradient now starts to increase. He's inside five kilometres to go, straight ahead under the shadows of the trees, round to the left, back to the right, and it's on to the climb proper. He's not too far away from making that right-hand turn. He's still holding on to an advantage of a minute and 39 seconds. And the church really dominates the landscape in Mont. It's one of the first things you see as you drive into the town, but having the advantage of this aerial shot, you can see just how imposing it is. The only thing that makes it look small is when you stand up here on the airfield of Monda, so high above the city, and you've only got three kilometres to get this high above the city. It is so steep. He's going to go left between the houses, just up the road. Kicks back to the right slightly, and he'll see it rise up in front of him like a wall. He made the right-hand turn. He saw the sign indicating the start of the climb. Three kilometres, that is the crucial part. He holds on to an advantage of one minute and 40 seconds. The chase again is being led by Quick Step. Philip Gilbert has returned to the front in the hope that Julien Alaphilippe can finish it off. The only way they'll catch him is if he completely cracks. Jasper Stoven, he has been so strong going across to Izagiri, contributing to the work, opening the gap, riding the others out of his wheel. 
and then steaming away from the rest of the break. Gilbert still on the chase. In second position is Peter Sagan. To start near the front, ride his own tempo and pick up more points for the King of the Mountains, not King of the Mountains jersey, the green jersey, the points classification. He was fifth last time the race finished up here in 2015 when Steve Cummings was the winner. He came from behind to surprise the two leaders in Pinot and Bardet. I'll be surprised if they can catch Stoven. He's in pain, but the rhythm is still good. He's riding a small gear. He's staying on top of it, not getting bogged down on these steep slopes, using all of his experience, and I say experience, he's only 26 in his second Tour de France. He's about 800 metres now ahead of this group. Doesn't sound much, but on inclines like this, he's still got a very handy gap. 142. Attack now by Thomas De Kent, giving it everything. He knows to win the stage. It's a bottom to top effort at 100%. They have to go early, and that's what De Kent has done. The rest are looking at each other. The reaction comes from Omar Frale in the Astana colours. There he is, the Spaniard. He's chasing. It's then Caruso from BMC. De Ghent with a lot of work to do because it's another Belgian on their national day, Sturven, who's got this race just about within his grasp. Well, it seems only an effort like this will be capable of pulling Jasper Sturven back right from the bottom of the climb, as hard as you can go all the way through to the finish line to hope to get back on terms. De Ghent, big gap initially. Freyla has now come across and is in the wheel of the Belgian. This has been a happy hunting ground for the Spaniards. Of the four previous ascents of this climb, twice it's been won by a Spaniard. But Fraule, he can't wait. He has to keep on going. No reaction yet from Julian Alaphilippe sitting in third wheel, further behind the rest of the group that remains. Greg Van Avermaet in front, or is that Caruso? Caruso on the front. It's then Geshka, followed by Alaphilippe. But here is the hero. It is Super Sturven this afternoon. Three and a half kilometres to go means 1.8 kilometres of climbing for the Belgian from Trek Segafredo. Fraley now goes in front of Thomas de Ghent. The rest of the group still Caruso. Geshka Alaphilippe, Danny Martinez, Daryl Impey still there, and Peter Sagan on the back of the group. Stoven, he's giving it his all. Can he hang on and not fold? 11% gradient. His advantage now is down to 1 minute and 20 seconds. Fraley has now distance. Thomas De Ghent and for Fraule, this is an all-out effort to chase Jasper Sturven. Well, De Ghent is gone, but Fraule, to keep that tempo, and be surprised if he too doesn't blow up under the effort trying to cross this gap. One minute and seven seconds to Jasper Sturven. He's at the midpoint of the climb. For that group of chasers at a minute and 20 seconds to still be that big, not completely blowing apart, indicates they're not going quick enough. Stoven now comes on to the very hardest part of the climb. Gradients of 12 and 13%. There it is already 12 where Freyla is. This is the hardest part. If you can get through the next 500 metres and still have 30 seconds, he'll be well on his way to victory. Still no reaction from Alaphilippe. And now Thomas de Gens has been caught by that group that has been led by Damiano Caruso. Omar Freyla, his progress has stagnated because Jasper Sturven, he has not faltered. Well, Fraley, when he went, he looked smooth, he looked strong, he's rocking and rolling now. He takes the outside of the corner, staying away from the steep pinch on the inside, but he looks like he's starting to struggle. The gap's still holding above one minute for Sturven. And Peter Sagan continues to stay in contact with the group being led by Damiano Caruso. Three kilometres, 1,500 metres to the top of the climb. Freyle back in his rhythm. He's looking good, the Spaniard from Astana. He's at 57 seconds. This is tough, but he's brave. He's shown so much courage all day long. Omar Freyle. 13% the gradient here, and Freyle just eating up the gap of Jasper Sturven. 55 seconds and decreasing his gap, but he can afford to give a few seconds back. Five seconds over the top, he still should be okay. Danny Martinez now from behind for EF Trepak. Next in line, it's Simon Geshka trying to react to that move by Martinez. Fraule, 
at 150 metres. It doesn't sound like much, but it's still just on 50 to 55 seconds. It's 45 seconds, in fact. It's starting to crumble for Sturban. He'll be able to see him up the road in front of him now. Frele making an impact. Danny Martinez now starting to close the gap across to Frele. Geshka just staying in contention behind. Caruso setting a strong tempo. He'll be moving up in GC. And Alaphilippe behind Caruso. Is he going to go at all? And Peter Sagan is still on the back. They get to the top. And we may well see the green jersey attack the group and bridge the gap. Well, Frele, he is coming closer by a metre every second at the moment. Jasper Stoven back out of the saddle. He knows he just needs a little gap over the top, even if he's just caught over the top. Probably still got the speed to take on Frele, but he is also not slow. And Peter Sagan can still win this stage. He is still in contact. He is holding onto this group, being led by Caruso. There is the green jersey. He is a chance. He's always a chance, but on a stage like this, he's best in the past fifth from a breakaway. Freyler out of the saddle again. He too looks like he's starting to struggle now, but the gap is still coming down to Sturvan, who's starting to fold. He's buckling. Is he going to break? This is the chase further back down the road. Yes, for Sturvan. 11 kilometres per hour. 1.1 kilometres still to the top of the climb but and the then it's 1.5 to the finish line the last 500 of the climb is nowhere near as steep he's got 500 meters of really steep ramps to go then it eases off ala philippe is now on the charge he's been waiting patiently julian ala philippe in the king of the mountains jersey explodes out of what's left of the chasing group it's one kilometer to the top for jasper sturvan the big figure of the Belgian classic specialist is paying the price for all his work earlier on. Philippe is clear. Now he's on his own. He's bridging across to Omar Frele. 45. Sagan is starting to lose contact finally. 45 seconds for Philippe and starting to come across. It's to Frele, who's at 25. Jasper Stoven will know the climb is about to ease off. It's not as steep through to the KOM. It's long past the top of the steepest pinches. There's Frele in the distance, so Alaphilippe is lining them up, but has he left it too late? He can see his prey. He's aiming for his second, his team's fourth. There he is on the right-hand side of the screen, Omar Frele at 50 metres. Another 50 metres to the leader, and that is Jesper Sturven. Frele looks over his shoulder to see who's coming. That's a sign of him starting to crack. Jasper Sturven still holding on to about 25 seconds. 700 metres from the top of the climb, but the steepest part is nearly done. Jasper Sturven, can he just hang in there and keep them off his wheel to make the dive down onto the airfield? He's about to be caught. Omar Frele is reaching him still with 600 metres to climb. He needs to be able to hold on, and Sturban can still win the stage, and Frele knows it, so Frele goes. And now the Spaniard is on his own, but here comes Alaphilippe. Sturvan trying to hang in. Frele attacked over the top. He's out of the saddle again. He knows he's got to get rid of Sturvan because he'll be able to recover over the top, short downhill, and he'll be able to out sprint him. He needs to open the gap. Alaphilippe, he sees Sturvan just in front of him, and he can also see Frele. But Alaphilippe, could he beat either of them in a sprint? If Alaphilippe comes across to Jesper Sturvan, they can work together to re-catch Omar Frele, and then... It's anyone's. All three of them deserve it, particularly Jasper Sturvan. Here comes Alaphilippe. Well, the gap has opened right up from Frelet to Jasper Sturvan. He's over the steepest part of the climb now. It now eases off with two kilometres to go. He's up the gears. Sturvan out of the saddle, trying to close that gap back down. The gap is only about five or six seconds. The same back to Alaphilippe. Sturvan sees the stage win slipping away. The Spaniard from Astana, it's killing him, but he's nearly there. Jasper Sturvan has not surrendered. He's about to be joined by Julian Alaphilippe. 
Alaphilippe, this is a maximum effort to try and bridge that gap. It's 63 metres to Omar Frale. And the Spaniard isn't waiting for anyone. He knows how quick they are, those two behind him. Jasper Sturven looks like he's starting to get going in, finding his rhythm on this less steep section of the climb. Alaphilippe is now in his wheel. Fraley looking over the shoulder. He's totally not at ease with the situation yet. And now Alaphilippe has caught Jasper Sturven, but he's barely able to stay with him because this is the terrain now for Sturven as it flattens out ever so slightly. If they play cat and mouse, Fraley won't be seen again until the stage presentation. I think he's got enough. He's now on the downhill section. Quick downhill, right turn, left turn onto the aerodrome itself. I think Fraley has flown, but Stoven, he will not give up. He's going to try and power back across the gap that the Spaniards opened up. Steep little downhill section under the kilometre now for the Spaniard. It was his birthday four days ago. He turned 28 years of age. He won't mind that a Tour de France birthday present comes just a little bit late. He's inside the kilometre and he's almost there. He's about to start smiling, but don't smile yet. He's got one more corner to come. He looks back, he checks the gap. The look on his face says, I'm happy with this. Jersey up. He will not have this taken off him. He swings around the final corner with 400 metres to go. Omar Frale from Astana, he's going to get the victory in Monde. He's on his way to success. He has that one last check across the shoulder. Now the smile is broad. He can't afford to celebrate until he gets there. But look at the chase behind. Sagan is in the picture. It's celebration time. It's fabulous Frale who takes the win for Astana and shares the win with everybody around him. A big night for Astana. It's then Alaphilippe followed by Sturven and Saga in fourth. Well, that in itself is an incredible ride by Peter Sagan, fourth of the stage. Caruso in fifth. Geschke, he's followed across the line Ede. by Ede. Kalmajan is the next one through. This is Daryl Impey. Serge, that's the team doctor. One of the Swaniers in there with the big hug and the glasses on. Well, Freyle, he followed the acceleration by Thomas again. In fact, went across to the Kent, left him behind, and just ate up the gap between himself and Jasper Sturven. Heartbreaking for Sturven. He was almost over the steep part of the climb, and it was the chase by Philip Gilbert for his teammate Alaphilippe, who brought Sturven undone, and it wasn't Alaphilippe who could profit to the maximum. Two dogs fighting over a bone. Third one runs in and takes the spoils. Meanwhile, the race for yellow is just getting started with 10 kilometres to go. What Gorka. could have been for Gorka Izagiri had he just stayed in the wheel of Jasper Sturven and not argued with Tom Yelta Slachter. Philippe Schilbert, he tried hard to close the gap down in service of Julien Alaphilippe, and I think purely Alaphilippe left it too late. Timothy Degan sitting on his wheel. Alaphilippe will be disappointed. Gilbert frustrated. Gilbert looks up at the results board to see who won. We'll see for him the bad news. Man of the day, Jasper Sturven. Incredible attack. We said he needed around a minute and a half to win the stage. Well, maybe a minute 32. Any sort of climb. In fact, the gaps are opening up for Tom Dumoulin. This is an opportunity for Sky to put some distance between Froome and Dumoulin. It's Bernal now for Team Sky in front of Geraint Thomas, Nairo Quintana, Roman Bardet, Stephen Kreuzweig, then Chris Froome. This is the back of the group. Pozzovivo in red. He goes out the back. So does Nieve. This is Lander and Valverde at the back for Movistar. Roglic still with a little bit of a gap. Bernal doing the chasing. Froome is also being dropped. He looks across. He comes back. He's got it under control. Kreuzweik is with him. 
Adjusts the grip on the handlebars, puts his finger imprints as he grabs on and winds up. And Tom Dumoulin is losing ground. There he's back a picture. He's just a couple of metres off Dumoulin, but fighting to get back in that wheel of Chris Froome. He rides in the style of Miguel Indurain, a time trial specialist, ignores the accelerations of everybody else and just works his way back. Riding on his own limits and the gap is not opening anymore. But Tom Dumoulin, one big acceleration from the group in front, he could really get distance. Geraint Thomas looks comfortable behind Bernal. They still have 800 metres to go to the top of the climb. It's Roglic in front, Bernal in white, Thomas in yellow, Quintana then from Movistar, followed by Bardet, Froome, Kruzweig and Dumoulin is in there somewhere just behind the motorbikes. 200 metres until they finish the steepest section of the climb. Dumoulin has gone past the motorbikes. He's on the rear wheel of Froome again. Well, Roglic, he is riding about five or six seconds ahead of the rest of the group at the moment. Bernal still on the front. Geraint Thomas, he looks fine. He's coping with this climb. Bernal number two, Thomas number eight. 71 for Quintana, 32 Dumoulin. No number four Bardet, one is Froome. 161 is Kruzweig and Tom Dumoulin from the back to the front and go. He is attacking. Well, Dumoulin has to have a go. Tempoed himself, let the gap open up, cruised his way back across it. Now he's distancing Bardet and Kroeswijk both drop. Thomas is there. Quintana follows from Froome. He can also follow the pace, but it's the Frenchman Bardet who's sliding backwards. And Dumoulin makes his way across towards Roglic over the steepest part of the climb now. You had me dropped, you think you can, but I know you won't. Dumoulin is back and showing that he is a force to be reckoned with in this year's Tour de France. And look at the gap now to Kroeswijk, along with Bernal and Bardet. Thomas goes through, flick of the elbow. Narrow Quintana, does he ignore it or contribute to distance Bardet? He picks up the pace. Roglic still clear in front of the rest of the favourites. Here comes Chris Froome with Thomas in his wheel. And he's counter-attacking Dumoulin who now finds himself having to chase. And Thomas takes over from Froome over the top of the climb. Bardet loses more ground. The grimace from Bardet is in the red zone. Dumoulin, he's at five, six metres. And they swing into the slipstream of the motorbike briefly, chasing Roglic and Dumoulin. He's not on the wheel yet. He just about is. But they won't now. get rid of him. Now he is. This is the podium of the tour as it stands at the moment. First, second and third and in four that order. In front of them up the road, Roglic stealing a few seconds. These riders all match each other. One kilometre to go for the Slovenian. Thomas in front of the chasers. This is just for time gaps. There's no stage win up for grabs on this occasion. That's already been won by Omar Frale. Primus Roglic. Really is a challenger at this year's tour, at least for a top three finish. He started the day in fourth position. Lotto and Al Jumbo have been the aggressive throughout this race. The big attack to Alp is by Kruzweig, the move to Mon by Roglic. It might gain him just a little bit of time, but it all counts. And behind him, it's Thomas leading through. It's not Froome doing the work for the yellow jersey. It's Thomas, the domestic. Now it's Froome. But Thomas surely is getting so close to equal leadership within Team Sky. Dumoulin again has shown himself as their big rival. Roglic can't be forgotten. Well, look at the gaps opening up. Froome, Dumoulin and Thomas across the line. And behind, what is the damage? Quintana lost the wheel. He sprints his way in and further behind, Kroeswijk, Bernal, and importantly, Roman Bardet. They have given away 15, 16 seconds on our current podium places. Stage winner was fabulous Fralle. He collects success for Astana.